start. Hello students, good morning. Welcome to the Faculty of Medical Sciences Orientation Program. We are on day four of our five day session. And this morning we have for you some lineups on our presentations. First up, we have Dr. Bidyasa. He is the head of CMSE. He's going to do an assessment practice, an online assessment of PBL. I now hand over to Dr. Sa. Good morning, Dr. Sa. Hi, good morning, students. Welcome once again to this Faculty of Medical Sciences. So we are now going to have a presentation on the assessment practices of the PBL. And here yesterday you had the opportunity to see the presentation on the PBL that is problem-based learning. So welcome from the school environment to the university environment of problem-based learning. So problem-based learning basically engage you, involve you in solving the problem, in analyzing the problem, and in critically and clinically thinking the problem. So when you talk about curriculum delivery, I will take you through my presentations now. The critical issue of the problem-based learning is the assessment. So as you know, there is an organization called UNESCO, that is United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organizations. And they were running an hashtag, learning never stops. As you can see that we are continuing online learning. So with that online learning, now once the learning is taking place, we need to assess you. And that's why the FMS says that assessment to continue. As long as learning is there, the assessment needs to continue because we need to certify you that you have achieved the competencies, the learning objectives that you are expected to learn. And that's how we have to continue the assessment that too also through online. So I'll take you through how the PBL assessment is done here and what are the things you need to know because when you talk about all those things, you have the every right to know what on what basis you are going to be assessed so that you will be in a better position to demonstrate your knowledge your skills, your abilities, your attitude. So before that, going into the detail, I will take you through the what we call our mission of the university. You can see the mission of the university is about what? Creating knowledge. You are the knowledge creator. And excellence in teaching, research, innovation, public service, intellectual leadership, outreach, in order to support, because when you are coming out of a graduate with all these abilities, you are going to support social, economic, political, cultural development of the Caribbean and the wider world. So this is the mission of the university. And again, in that way, our FMS mission is very clear here that faculty of medical science and faculty of medical sciences, the mission is to train health professionals to meet the needs and improve the care of those whom you will serve. So to strive for professional excellence while contributing to the social, economic, cultural, 
development of the Caribbean and also inculcating the graduates as an attitude of lifelong learning. You can see that I have highlighted in red the lifelong learning. So what I mean to say that you can see very clearly the mission and vision of the faculty is in alignment with the mission and vision of the university. So what I'm trying to say here, we would like to demonstrate this. In order to be a successful graduate, you have to learn all these skills. Because when you are coming out of the University of West Indies, you are expected to be a distinctive UE graduate. And what are the characteristics of a distinctive UE graduates? That they must demonstrate the critical thinking. They must demonstrate an effective communicator. They should be IT literate, information technology literate. They should be innovative and entrepreneurial in their thinking process. And also, they should be aware of the development taking place globally as well as locally and regionally so that their thinking will be guided for the social development and cultural and environmental development of the region by strong ethical values. So I talked about so many things about the UE distinctive graduates. So in order to reach that, we need to train you in such a way that you will be entitled to claim that we have those characteristics. Again, I will just talk about one model here. When you talk about a medical expert, whether it is from nursing, whether it is from dentistry, whether it is from pharmacy, any school, we think that they are the professionals. They are the communicator. They are the collaborators. And they are the health advocate. They are the manager and they are the scholars. So in order to inculcate all those thinking into your learning process, what we have done is our problem-based learning. Now we can see that how our learning process is not just we want to problem do problem-based learning. Because we want to inculcate all those qualities in you, that's why we have to go for problem-based learning. And if this problem-based learning, it requires you. What does it require? It requires to develop hypothesis in a problem, which we already have learned yesterday presentations. It, it requires you to raise the issues. It requires you to develop the learning outcomes, develop the hypothesis, develop the research questions, select the problem, identify the different sources. These are the involvement of the students in, in all the different processes. So in order to do that, you must have certain qualities. And these are the qualities we are looking for. What are the qualities? You should have a right attitude. Attitude of what? Right, right attitude of solving the problem right attitude of thinking, right attitude of interpersonal skills, right attitude of having communicated with your peers. So what I'm trying to say here, my dear student, is that you, need, you have all those qualities in you. That's why you are selected to this faculty. Through problem-based learning, we will nurture it further. And again, according to our standard, how much you have achieved those qualities, we will try to assess it. When you talk about assessment, what happened? This is, I will just try to show a video to you. I am trying to, can you play it? So, Okay, sorry, not play. Can you play from there? 
so colleagues sorry students what i am trying to say is that uh you when you talk about assessment you see here how the students get panicked so students you saw just a short video and it is self explanatory because i do believe you are the 20 learners and you believe in video learning and audio learning so that is self explanatory so for that reason we don't our students to get panic for that reason we have this all orientation session to update you what is expected from you basically what happen when you talk about assessment the teachers think that whatever they are teaching they are learning but the students think if i am given marks then only i am going to learn it in other words for students grading only drives the learning but for teachers learning drives everything which is not true always for the students so when you talk about assessment there are so many modalities of assessment starting from essay type questions reports written assessment oral presentations examinations performance artistic work unlimited there are so many ways seeing your skills abilities your aptitude your attitude in the program you have registered for so for that reason we have designed two forms of assessment basically what we call synchronous assessment and asynchronous assessment when you talk about synchronous assessment it goes in real time it can be face to face it can be online let's say what we are now communicating with you through to zoom at the real time this is a synchronous mode of communications so if i want to conduct a viva 
oral exam or any other thing i can conduct then it will be called synchronous mode of assessment in real time while in the asynchronous mode of assessment in that environment what happen it does not take place in real time it can be in any form you can take home assignment you can bring it after two days three days according to the time limit given by the your instructor so this is the thing i would like to make it clear because of the environment we are now going through this covid 19 pandemic as you know this situation is totally different that's why we are having now online orientation which is otherwise it should have been happening face to face so as your mode of teaching is also now online so also your mode of assessment will be online and it could be both it could be synchronous it could be asynchronous but we make sure that our assessment practices are fair accessible to all our students and we maintain the integrity of our assessment so now i am talking about these two things here in the semester 1 all the students from vet school from dental school and from medical school they have to go through these courses one course that is from the preclinical department that is mdsc 1401 that course called environment and health and the next course is paraclinical those are the two courses 1405 1406 and they are called basic paraclinical sciences one and two respectively so when i say this each department operates according to your, according to their own practices so i will talk about now first preclinical department so whatever course you have now that is mdsc 1401 or any other course you will be going through the preclinical department in the semester 2 and 1 then the assessment mode will be what there will be two parts one is 30 percent continuous assessment and that 30 percent continuous assessment will consist of 5 percent pbl process assessment which i will talk about now 10 percent pbl explanation and objective assessment which i will talk about now the rest 15 percent will be in terms of the any seminar any laboratory sessions that they would like to conduct now next 75 percent because of the situation now we cannot have the face-to-face -face exam most probably it will be asynchronous take home exam so for that purpose it can be any form it can be essay type questions it can be mcq type questions for all those short answer questions name it any form but here it could be there will be a time limit and the minimum time limit set by the university is 24 hours 24 hours minimal minimum time limit to submit your exams now when you go to paraclinical department if you see here that in the paraclinical department uh, again 30 percent is the continuous assessment here it is a little bit different five percent pbl assessment is the same for everybody but there will be what we call progressive disclosure question that will contain 25 percent of your marks and again the final exam which could be asynchronous for your final semester exam that will carry 70 percent and again it could be essay type questions extended matching questions or multiple choice question or short answer questions or any other form of assessment that will assess your critical thinking your clinical reasoning 
your clinical thinking skill that will be assessed so again here you have 24 hour time limits minimum it can be 48 hours it can be 72 hours depending upon the nature of assessment task now coming to here i was talking about mcq you know it very well when you talk about an mcq then there are two types of mcq in the medical field one is what we call correct answer type mcq as you know in mcq we have four or five options for one question you have to choose the correct answer so when i say correct answer type mcq what i mean is that out of the four or five options one answer is correct beyond doubt that's what we call correct answer type mcq but when you talk about best answer type mcq you know that you are in the medical profession nothing is absolute where most of the expert agree the degree of correctness of the question or answer depends so you have four or five options one because there is you see in the medical profession there is no this is the only treatment you have for this patient there are so many treatment available for different patients so that's why i say this is called best answer type questions so you will be given again four or five options you have to choose the best option that is what we call best answer type mcq now emq here extended matching questions it is just like an mcq but here we have to answer that where there are more than five options you have one question there are more than five options and you have to pull the a set of questions and answer and match it now i will go to the next one that is what we call pdq pdq that is what we call progressive disclosure questions what happened the you will be presented with different lab results different case scenario and you will be asked different questions on different issues so let's say we are presenting a case and after that you will be asked some question once you answer that question based on the same answer what you have given you will be asked another question so that's why you are progressively exploring one case let's say five questions will be based on one case and you will be asked to answer all those questions now i am going to the next present next slide here now i am coming to the pbl process assessment there are two issues here when you are conducting yourself that is the pbl process in the pbl tutorial and knowledge aspect knowledge aspect of your learning it will be assessed in the exam that is what we call mcq essay type short answer type questions but when you talk about the process we will assess in the pbl process assessment rating scale which i am going to talk about now so for this process you know you have to demonstrate your skills that the skill i talk about in the initial presentation the skill of what the skill of your critical thinking the skill of your communicating the skill of your dealing with the group behavior which i will talk about so it depends upon your performance not on your personalities you have to have the demonstrate the your skills in order to get the marks it is based on the evidence not about the feelings when i say this that you have to demonstrate so that you are producing the evidence that you know the skill you have mastered the skills it is not that some teacher is feeling poor or for some teacher is feeling sympathetic about you you will get the marks you have to demonstrate your skills now now again there is a purpose clearly defined performance conditions so when i talk about this 
you will be given a situation where you have to demonstrate your skill let's say in the lab situation you will be provided different materials different chemical and in that environment you have to demonstrate your skills now published goal measurable criteria agreed upon form of evidence when i say this what i mean is that you have the learning objectives those are the goals we have the measurable criteria which i will talk about your critical thinking your 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 team behavior your development of hypothesis your communication skill all those things will be taken care of now assessment is based on multi dimensional evidence when i say this all your dimensions it cannot be measured by one instrument so we use so many modes of assessment when i say that i mean we use mcq we use pbl assessment we use pdq there will be seminar there will be presentation there will be online session of discussion group discussions so the idea behind is that no students is deprived of demonstrating their skills or abilities because of the assessment types you should have a full opportunity to demonstrate your skill some students may be very good at communicating they can demonstrate they will get marks some students may be very good at written written exam they can demonstrate there that's why we want to be fair to our students and that's how it done now what is the goals of pbl assessment when i say it is not about only grading it is more about what giving you constructive feedback feedback of how you are progressing how your learning is being monitored you are by giving this feedback we are monitoring your learning and when i say that the feedback has a very very important role you must know where you stand suppose you stand here and you have to reach there how can you reach there unless or until you know where you stand and this can be done through constructive feedback so you have the every right to ask your tutor that how am i doing so that you know where you stand and where you have to go so once you get the feedback the gap between where you stand and where you need to go it could be minimized that is the purpose of the feedback now again improve in the challenge dimensions so if you are somebody is lagging behind in communication skill where there is scope for improvement that could be done by feedback capitalizing on already possessed abilities suppose you have some good qualities how to strengthen it let's say some student is very much communicative and talking very sensible thing he or she could be the group leader of the pbl sessions that's how you are capitalizing on the abilities so that's how it happened now next is what monitoring and supporting your learning you need to know how you are selling through how many objectives you have learned so you are the teacher by assessment what happen the teacher monitors your learning process and your learning process will be assessed against the learning objectives and finally we are giving grade it is not about the grading only so please don't misunderstand that assessment is for only grading for getting 4 out of 5 marks no it has much more function much more objectives than just getting grades okay now i am talking about pbl process assessment here we throw the different approaches the pbl process is assessed but here you are using what we are using tutor facilitator assessment model when i say this 
what i mean is that the tutor who will be facilitating your pbl tutorial he will be assessing you and the absence from the any pbl class and non engagement in the pbl process definitely it will affect your overall assessment now i am coming to the next slide here when i say pbl process as i mentioned before it is 5% out of the 30% assessment now whatever criteria we are listing now i will talk about that then it will be you will be assessed on those criteria so during the pbl process you are not only assessed on the basis of your knowledge but also you will be assessed on the basis of your skills attitude and values and you will be assessed on a six sorry five point scale from very poor to excellent so now again i will go back to the slide that i had initially presented to you just to relate you that okay this is the thing these are the aspects necessary in the pbl process and these are the qualities which is needed to perform competently in the pbl tutorial so accordingly these are the assessment scale we will be using which i will be this is a just the form that will be used for your pbl assessment so what are those 12 criteria i will just read out in my next slides then we will talk about that now the first criteria the 12 criteria you see here here we have the 12 criteria and that 12 criteria is assessed on a five point scale from very poor to excellent and overall assessment from novice to expert or master so in that 12 criteria what are those criteria because as you know we have a seven steps process of the pbl so in that seven step what we have to do is that when you are defining the problem you should be able to define clarify analyze the problem the problem you will be presented by the tutor now next what we need to do is that for the definition of the problem you need to define the problem you have to clarify the problem translate the problems into different task and your analysis of the problem should be very much insightful so these are the things you are looking for and i am sure that you will be shared one introductory pbl booklet or you might have been already shared so if you see that booklet everything is written there now second criteria what is the criteria ability to generate hypothesis and test the hypothesis so hypothesis means what the intellectual guesses intellectual guess so when you talk about intellectual guess your hypothesis should be sound intellectually it should be relevant and it should be deep insight when you say deep insight it should talk about the problem according to your learning objectives that has been given by the sorry that is that will be developed by the group in the tutorial sessions the next is generate the learning objectives you will not be given any learning objectives the tutor have the learning objectives so what learning objectives you will develop after going brainstorming the problem after looking for the literature those objectives will be now what happen you have to develop and when you are developing those objectives it must be significant it must be unique it must be innovative it must be insightful and it must also talk about 
significant issues of the problem relevant to the problem that is what we talk about then only you will be assessed so if you are developing a very good relevant meaningful objectives what happen you will get 5 in the 5 point scale if your learning objective is very low standard not relevant to the problem you may get 1 if your learning objectives are average you may get 3 it depends now again what are the next one coming to the next uh, criteria ability to select sort synthesize evaluate learning resources so when you are doing the brainstorming before doing the brainstorming you have the opportunity to look for the different sources so make sure that you are when you are discussing the problem you are quoting the information from the authentic sources the high quality informations and you are able to get the correct information quality of the information is authentic and you are using the correct way to collect the information so that when you are sharing the information in the group it will not be questioned i am not talking about questioning about the issues i am talking about the credibility of the information that you are sharing there it should not be questions now next criteria what is that cognitive reasoning and critical thinking when i say that this is the critical of the problem based learning we want to trigger your thinking skills you remember that what i was talking in the initial way initial slides of my presentation you are distinctive graduates critical thinkers innovators so you see this is how we realize the mission by integrating those qualities into the curriculum so the students can learn those skills learn those abilities and become the ue distinctive graduates so next self monitoring skills self monitoring skill means what being aware of about your own strength and weaknesses suppose somebody they in a group discussion of five or six students there is some argument and discussion you should have the courage to admit that okay the information i was sharing was wrong i understand the quality of your information you are sharing your colleagues are sharing are very very quality so again that is strength and weakness again when i say that how you communicate you cannot talk about over other people that is again self monitoring skills when somebody is speaking you should take the permission from the whoever the tutor you should take the permission from the person who is speaking so that is way you train the people we train the people in such a way that those skills are instilled in our graduates so we instill those qualities in our graduates now again i will go to the next one what is that ability to demonstrate initiative curiosity and open mindedness you see this is the thing we want to create i understand you are coming from a different school across the country across the globe across the region now university is a platform you have to interact with people from different culture different religion different countries different ethnic background so you need to be open minded so the same way you need to be open and minded in your campus life in your online campus community same way you need to be open minded in accepting the views during the pbl problem views of others you should able to respect it you may disagree 
it is okay to disagree as long as you are not disagreeable so the point i am trying to make is that you should be open minded there will be different views so many different views it does not if somebody does not agree it does not mean that he is a bad person or you will develop some bad blood for him or her it is about accepting the views if there is something that is evidence based information logical views you must respect it rational views you must respect it now again <clears throat> next one is about what organizing organization and preparation for the group again how much let's say you are starting the pbl 9 o'clock you are coming 9:30 that is not an organizational skill you should be ready to be on time you should be prepared with your material that okay i have to talk about from these sources you should be ready with your all the information and that could be easily reflected if you are online also let's say if you are somebody is asking question in the group and you are not able to answer you are looking here and there you are on you are not unmuting your mic it means there is something wrong about your readiness now again commitment participation of the group so in all these group activity how much you are able to actively participate in the group process how much you are able to contribute to the group harmony you can see that it is clearly mentioned there now again ability to express ideas ability to use the language and these are the criteria so how you are using the different language different sorry different language skills and all those things now last one i will talk about collaborative skills what is the collaborative skills means you why why it is important let me tell you why it is important now in your health profession practice you are not practicing as a single handedly it is a team practice you need involvement about the nurse you need involvement from the other health professionals you need involvement from the uh, other uh, other practitioners let's say you are in a operation theater you are not going to operate by yourself now you may be taking doing some operation in the operation theater by team of doctors so you should be able to make collaborative decisions how and that skill you see how futuristic how futuristic is pbl learning we want to make you prepare for those future profession of medicine those future profession of nursing or dentistry or veterinary sciences so that's how we are training you should see value in the pbl okay i can tell you that sometimes you may get marks by not attending the classes or getting the somehow information but the process through which we would like to nurture your skill if you don't participate you will miss that opportunity so that is very very critical your involvement is very very critical now next is about the team skill when i talk about the team skill because you know pbl operate in small group and in that pbl group session you have to show commitment to the group work why because you see in our one of the courses in the pre clinical i will tell you there will be a group work where you will get 10% of marks what is that pbl explanation of the problem so for that <clears throat> again we have to test those skills now besides this 12 criteria that i listed to you now overall how are you performing overall global performance 
whether you are at the novice level, the same level when you came to the university from your high school to here, are you at the same level or you have reached to the different level? The tutor will assess you on this criteria. Novice to exemplary on a five point scale. Now, this is about the PBL process assessment. So you know that our MBBS program, our DDS program, our DVM program are accredited. When I say that accredited, there is an institute called CAMHP, Caribbean Accreditation Authority for Medicine and Other Health Professionals that accredited the different programs so that when you go with the certificate of the University of West Indies Faculty of Medicine, MBBS, DBM or DDS program and show that certificate, okay. Now we can say that we have come through a quality program. So when I bring this word quality, we want to ensure that our PBL process is quality of the standard. It is meeting the highest standard. For that, we do again different forms of assessment. What? You know, you will be experiencing the, you will be given the PBL problem. So in that PBL problem, what happened? After the PBL problem, each, pro each PBL group are required to evaluate each problem so that in the next academic year or in the next semester, we can improve the PBL problem. That is the evaluation of the PBL problem. And in that PBL problem evaluation form, besides the 5% just I've explained about the 12 criteria you will get, in some courses, you will be assessed on students' evaluation of the PBL, and that will carry the 10% of the marks just I mentioned before. So there you have to explain the problem. And for that, what? That your problem explanation must be correct, must be relevant, must be of high quality, showing the nobility so that it could be, it should be standing out among the group and for that marks whatever you will get 10 percent marks it is a group mark you will get so that group mark it will not be given the same suppose in that group 10 out of the group mark is eight marks not everybody will be given eight marks that eight marks will be weighted against the attendance so if you have less attendance accordingly, the, your group marks will be factored into. So that is the key thing. Now, this is about the student's evaluation of the PBL problem and giving the problem explanation marks 10%. So those feedback we will take into consideration and ensure the quality of the PBL problem. Now, PBL tutors, they will be also giving feedback about the quality of our PBL problem. This is about the quality assurance. This has nothing to do with your getting the marks or not. I am trying to emphasize here how much we are particular to ensure that our students experience the best educational experience in the University of the West Indies. Now, again, when I say this, now, PBL tutor evaluation. Now, again, this is the, again, students will evaluate each PBL tutor. Each PBL tutor students will evaluate. And in that evaluation, if we find any of the tutor is not up to the mark, then we organize different training session for them. 
and make sure that they are delivering the best thing to our students. So now you understand there are different forms of assessment just to make it round up here that first is students will be assessed on their different skills, critical thinking, problem solving, developing hypothesis, developing learning objectives, developing communication skill, developing team behavior, those will be assessed given 5% marks individual. Second, the next is about what we call that, uh, the next is about PBL problem evaluation by the students. So students will be giving feedback about the PBL problem. Also in that form, there will be one section called problem eval problem explanations by the students. So students need to explain the problem and for that they will given group marks and that group mark will be weighted against the attendance. The next tutor also assess the PBL problem so that we can improve in the next semester. Finally, the student has to evaluate each and every student has to evaluate the PBL tutor and make sure that our tutor are doing well in delivering the program. Now, all these assessment, whatever I mentioned just now, it will go online. And your coordinator, your PBL tutor will provide the link so that all these forms you can see online and you will know where you are assessed, where you stand, all those things can be addressed. Now, when I say all those things, it is therefore very imperative for you to participate in the whole PBL process. You may get marks by not attending, that is not a problem, but if you are not involved, if you don't express your thinking, your understanding, you mind it that you are missing out in improving your own communication skill, using the correct medical terminology, how to pronounce the different medical terminologies, and having your tested ideas by the group. Because you see, in future, you have to talk to the different group of practitioners. So this is the training session we are trying to give you. So you miss out the learning and growing as an individual if you miss out the PBL sessions. With that, I end my presentations. If you have any questions and comments, we are ready to take for next five minutes. And with that, we'll be wishing you a very productive academic sessions. So I have some question here. No questions? No questions. Okay. So here, with that, we end our session. So I hope if you have any questions or any comments, you can talk to directly to your PBL tutor, directly to your course coordinator, and make sure that you are being engaged in the PBL tutorial online. For us, it may be first time online PBL, but you are the 21st century learners. Be mindful of it. So the 21st century learner should be engaged online. There are universities, they are doing this online PBL long time back. So don't miss the opportunity to get engaged in the PBL session, express yourself. It will be a great opportunity where you will be trained as the best professional in the future. Let me tell you just before ending, we have only one minute here. Before ending, I would like to say that our graduates stands out. Sometimes students don't realize the importance of the PBL when in the, they are in the preclinical years. But when they go to the clinical years, they learn the importance how to communicate, how to talk, 
how to pronounce the correct medical terminology. So they learn the importance. Even the external examiners for your seniors, there is a strong comment that our graduate stands out because of this PBR. We can strongly attribute that our final year graduates, they stands out because of this preclinical experience of the problem-based learning. With that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much. Once again, best of luck and welcome to the Faculty of Medical Sciences to all the programs you have registered for. So now I have the opportunity to introduce my dean, our dean, Dean Professor Terence Simangal, who is a professor of medicine, who will be addressing you about students advising issues, and he will be guiding you how we, you will be placed in this esteemed faculty. So, Prof. You are welcome to this session. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Sir. I was listening to your talk. Well done. I, I was quite impressed. A tour de force on PBL. Thank you very much. PBL is, in Thank fact, uh, very, very uh, a cornerstone of our clinical training. Problem-based learning is what we uh, have to do in, 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 in professional practice, whether it is optometry, uh, nursing, clinical medicine, veterinary medicine, dentistry, or pharmacy. We are always faced with professional problems and we have to come up with methods of solution uh, based many times on incomplete knowledge of the problem. That type of approach you will learn a lot more of when you get to the clinical years, but it is important that you are introduced to that type of thinking now. That's the purpose of it. Um, Dr. Reed and perhaps Dr. Khatija Khan, I, I seem to have misplaced my copy of the program, but Dr. Reed and Dr. Khatija Khan will be coming to talk to you all just now, and I don't wish to steal their thunder as it were. But what I want to do is to just uh, tell you all what a pleasure it is to welcome you into this faculty. Uh, it is the oldest faculty of the University of the West Indies, having started in 1947 in Kingston, in Jamaica. And in 1969, as you may have heard, we started the fifth year teaching in the medical school so that was the only school that was opened here. And in 1976, we added the fourth year, but the full five-year faculty that would be teaching in a medical school did not commence their work here until the late 1980s. And our first graduates were 1991, 1992. At that point, we had a veterinary school. We had a dental school. And later on, the School of Pharmacy and the School of Nursing. Uh, those two schools were added. So it is a faculty that has been going for some time and has a lot of experience in the training of students at professional level. You will notice, those of you who have done other degrees, that there's a difference in our degree structure, our courses, compared to other faculties. You have no choice. And when we bring our questions, you also have no choice. The reason is that when a problem presents to you in professional practice, you have no choice. You can't refuse it. That's your profession, it's what you do. So you are expected to have a minimum basic knowledge, something that we call minimum competence in all areas of the curriculum, which allows you then to practice at an appropriate level professionally. And that is the assurance that we give to the society. I need you all to understand this. 
that you are involved in the care of other people's health, apart from the veterinary school where it is animals, but they are still living beings. And you bring professional, a professional level of expertise to the care of these living beings. And the society has a trust that you will do that in a certain way. And that is the way that we teach you. So when we graduate you, we have to be able to assure the society that you have met that minimal level of competence. And that is what this curriculum is designed to give you. Hence, no choice. You answer all the questions that are given to you and you must be able to get them right or a certain minimal number of them. So once you pass, you are at the level that's required for practice. So I don't want to take any more time. I just wanted to let you know of these issues that perhaps make the Faculty of Medical Sciences very different from other faculties. Um, but also understand that we are aware that because of this, uh, the way that the, 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 the curriculum is structured, you will get stress. We expect that you, all professions have stress. That's how it is. We have to learn to cope with it, but we also have support structures within the faculty and Dr. Reed and her colleagues will advise you about that. So without further ado then, I thank you for joining us this morning and I look forward to hearing Dr. Reed's and her colleagues' presentation. I see Dr. Rafiq there. I guess you are joining her, Dr. Rafiq. Is that right? From the dental school. Okay. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you very much, Professor Simangal, for that welcome. We now, next up on our program, introduce Dr. Sandra Reed. Dr. Sandra Reed is the Deputy Dean of Clinical Sciences for all schools in the Faculty of Medical Sciences. She is a psychiatrist and teaches in the psychiatry unit where year four students meet her. Dr. Reed is also the chair of the Academic Advising and Mentoring Committee with a passion for ensuring that students have the optimal experience during their academic journey. Dr. Reed, I welcome you. Thank you, Ms. Ramata Singh. And good morning, students. Good morning, colleagues. I would like to join with everyone you have heard from so far in welcoming you to the Faculty of Medical Sciences. It is a unique time to begin your journey in your selected health profession. You have an exciting four to five years ahead. We just have to trust that the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic will serve to build your resilience and your capacity for coping as you are forced to adjust to the new normal. So as your orientation progresses, this morning's focus is on academic advising and mentoring in the faculty. If you have heard that the programs in the faculty are stressful and demanding, that's true. Medical education is not a breeze, but what is equally true is the fact that you have come into this faculty with the ability to succeed the resilience to cope with any hurdle, including the COVID-19 pandemic, and the capacity to be a successful professional in your chosen field. I like to think of academic advising and mentoring as one of the links between those two things, your challenges and your potential. It's the activities of the faculty that ensure that you complete your program successfully and on time, in spite of whatever is happening with and around you. It's about recognizing when the way you approach your work is not the way that brings your best performance. And it's also about stress, the stress of your program and from whatever life throws at you in the next several years. Succeeding in spite of stress requires an awareness of when one is stressed. Being able to cope in a healthy manner and not just ignoring it 
and also be in a way of when it begins to affect you academically and doing something about that. For some, that happens naturally, but the aim of academic advising and mentoring at the Faculty of Medical Sciences is to encourage you to do just that. So what exactly is academic advising? Put simply, it is any interaction between you, the student, and an advisor that assists in the development and achievement of your educational goals. It may be as simple as getting information, let's say about registration, or how to sign up for a co-curricular course. The administrative assistant in your school or department is an academic advisor who can direct you to necessary information, answer your questions, and help you to settle in. Every one of your lecturers is also an academic advisor. Talk to them if you are experiencing any challenges. The idea is to deal with the problems before they get big enough to affect your academic performance and result in failure. If you should fail an exam, the academic advising becomes mandatory. And here's what happens. The advisor then becomes aware that the student felt lost in the course from the start of the semester or that there were problems with the group leader, or the student was experiencing family issues or financial issues or relationship problems that were present throughout the course of the semester, culminating in a failed examination. Talking to an advisor early may prevent failure. They can guide you in your study habits or the areas to prioritize. Advisors do not provide counseling for problems that you may have, but they can refer you to the many services offered by the university that may assist you. The UWI is impressive in the wide range of student services that they offer. I'm sure you would have heard about some of them during the course of this week. Sometimes it's not an academic issue that you want to talk about. You may just want to get some personal support and guidance as you navigate the academic program. You may have questions like, am I in the right field? Am I responding to this pandemic in a healthy way? How do I manage career and family in the future? Is the specialty I'm, speci specialty I'm interested in likely to give me the income I desire? All of those are matters that you might want to discuss with a mentor someone who is experienced in the field and can provide healthy, informed discussion. We encourage every school to randomly assign each student to a mentor. This is done in groups and you should receive information on your group members and your assigned mentor within the next couple of weeks. We encourage the mentors to set up WhatsApp groups for easy communication but the times are challenging now and persons are stretched rather thinly. So if you don't hear from your mentor, don't hesitate to reach out to him or her as an individual or as a group. Finally, the faculty is committed to helping you cope with the demands of your program through workshops and stress management activities, which are planned based on feedback from you. So we want to hear from you through your class rep or directly to me or Ms. Ramutasing, who is hosting this uh, orientation via email. And we want to solicit your participation when these activities are scheduled. In a little while, Dr. Katija Khan, psychologist on the Academic Advising and Mentoring Committee will give you a preview of the kind of support we provide for students in the area of stress management. Before she comes on, however, I am pleased to introduce to you one of your peers, a student, Nirvana Dipnarain, in the class of 2024. I thought it would be very instructive for you to hear firsthand how an academic advising session might be useful. And she has kindly agreed to share with you one of her experiences of academic advising in the faculty. So without further ado, I wish you all the best in your program and I hand over now to Ms. Dipnerine. Thank you very much.
Hi, good morning. I'm Nirvana Deplorine, a year two MBBS student, and I was asked to talk briefly about how academic advising and the mentorship program has impacted me. But first, I would like to welcome you guys to the Faculty of Medical Sciences, and as well as your first step onto the path of becoming a healthcare professional. I know that right now it may not seem that you're getting full medical school experience from being at home, but I hope you guys could really make the best of it before we could be back on campus. Now, my first encounter with academic advising was at the start of first year, just like you guys are right now. But of course, this was during pre-COVID times. And during that session, they aided us with registration, which was very useful because we were quite foreign to this concept of registering online and we were unfamiliar with the program that was used and whatnot. So they really guided us through that process and they also gave us an idea about what to expect with classes and whatnot. And additionally, during the course of the school year, we were also provided with different workshops that offered health advice on such things such as how to study and how to cope with stress. And it was really, really worth checking out. So I hope you guys could do that as well. And secondly, one of the most fulfilling experiences I've had so far in my medical school experience was the mentorship program. So I was lucky enough to have Dr. Kenneth Charles as my mentor, and he's amazing at what he does. And he was also very passionate about his job. While we were under his mentorship, Dr. Charles took us into the wards, which was a very priceless opportunity. And we got our first real experience, like about a clinical setting. So even though we didn't know much, we got to interact with the patients as well as to exercise our knowledge with skills. And, you know, I was so excited to palpate deliver, even though I wasn't too sure what I was feeling, but it was a really great experience. So besides physically interacting with patients and getting to know their stories and really connecting with them, Dr. Charles was also, he gave us a lot of valuable lessons about um, healthcare, how it impacts you, yourself, your family, the community, and just to really understand what sort of role you would have as a healthcare professional in the future. And additionally, he also taught us how to appreciate the different levels of staff in the hospital. And honestly, like I kind of recommend this more to you guys. I really do hope you take part in the mentorship program. And like, I really want to thank the faculty for making that available to us because I believe that having a first hand experience with clinical experience, especially from such a young, like from year one, it would really give you guys the sort of push to study and gives you a sort of motivation in order to like to continue with your studies, et cetera, because you really kind of feel discouraged being a, like a classroom setting where you're not getting to apply this knowledge. So it's a really worthwhile experience. I hope you guys could take advantage of it. And as well as the academic advice and stuff that they have put in place for you guys. So I would like to wish you all the best and thank you guys for your attention. At this time, we would hear from Dr. Katija Khan. As I said before, Dr. Khan is the psychologist. She is attached to the psychiatry unit uh, in the faculty, and she's also a very valued member of the Academic Advising and Mentoring Committee. And this morning, she's going to do a presentation on stress management. I introduce to you, Dr. Khan. Hey, thank you, Dr. Reed, and good morning to everyone who's listening in. So I'm going to share screen with you. So today I want to talk to you about how to thrive in medical school. We don't just want you to cope with medical school. We don't just want you to get by in medical school. We want you to thrive. And so today I'll be talking a little bit about how you can uh, help manage some of those stresses that come with medical school. But first, let me join my colleagues in welcoming you to the University of the West Indies. I hope you are as excited on this day as we are to welcome you. Uh, the idea of welcoming another cohort who are going to be future graduates of the university fills us all with a lot of pride. And in addition to welcoming you to the university, we'd also like to welcome you to our Faculty of Medical Sciences. So we see this as a culmination of one of your dreams, getting to medical school. And we are quite keen and eager to help you get to your other goal, which is graduating from medical school. 
But first, let's acknowledge where we found ourselves today. So usually when we give these talks, we're face to face in amphitheater A. And one day before you graduate, you are going to experience being in amphitheater A. But because of what's going on, unfortunately, that's not the situation. We are all facing this global pandemic. And we have to recognize the effect that it's having on us. So first, let's acknowledge what the stress impact of the pandemic has been. It is a major global health disaster. And for everybody, it's brought about life changes and strains. So for example, there's been a significant adjustment to how you are starting off uh, medical school. It poses chronic stressors because at the beginning of this pandemic, we would have hoped, I think everyone had hoped, we'd be able to welcome you back to the campus. But unfortunately, or rather, we adapt and we welcome you online to the campus instead. But what that is demonstrating to us is that this pandemic is a chronic stressor. And because it's so uncertain and we're not quite sure how it's going to play out, we're going to have to learn how to deal with it for some time longer. And then finally, this pandemic can also pose daily hassles. So if anybody had difficulty logging on, if anybody had some connectivity issues, these little hassles may confront us. And you know what? Although they may not be as big of a stress as other issues, they can still accumulate. So we want you to be able to deal and cope effectively with all of these. And hopefully at the end of this session, you'll have some tips about how you can improve your own stress management. Okay? So what now does medical school look like in the age of COVID? So when you were dreaming about coming to the UE, I am sure you anticipated having face-to-face -face classes, having that hands-on experience of medical training, having the campus experience and being able to socialize and meet other students and enjoy the campus life. But instead, we've had to adapt. So because some of these things are no longer a reality right now, we have had to make changes. But guess what? Ever since the pandemic started, the UE has been preparing. We are trying to figure out how to keep you safe and still afford you the best quality of tertiary education. So of priority is your health and safety. And you know what? Maybe there might be some positives. Who amongst us loves traffic? Nobody. So one of the positives about being able to join in online like this is you don't have to commute. You don't have to fight up a traffic and worry about being late to attend your session. You can click and join in. And the technology now is so amazing. So 25 years ago, when I was in your position of starting university, guess what? There was no internet. There was no Wi-Fi. There were no cell phones and there were certainly no smartphones. So if this pandemic had happened 25 years ago, it would have severely disrupted my tertiary education. But you know what, 25 years on, we do have the technology now where we can bridge that gap between the face-to-face -face and the online. And so again, for the past few months, the UE has been engaging in training. We, all academics and staff, we have been building our competencies to figure out how best and how effectively to teach you online. So while there are some things that I'm sure you're disappointed in, and you're perhaps grieving that your start to university is not how you expected, I assure you that we have been working to fill those gaps until the time when we can return to the campus. So we want to talk today about stress. And so I just pointed out to you that, you know what, every one of us has been affected by stress. And there have been, everyone has faced some heightened levels of stress. Prior to the pandemic, we all have issues that we're dealing with in our personal lives or social lives, uh, but the pandemic has added to that. And what that means then is that stress management is going to be even more important than ever before. So one of the first things you need to ask yourself is how do you react when you are stressed? And the, first, the, the second thing we have to understand is, you know what, not all stress is bad. Stress is not a bad word in and of itself. 
there is a type of stress that's actually positive, and that's called eustress. That's the kind of stress that motivates us and challenges us. It makes us want to step up and perform, and that keeps us in the optimum zone of performance. So that's where we're in the yellow on this graph. When you have too little stress, then you kind of get complacent. You kind of get laid back, and you're not really operating and stepping up. So we want to find that zone of optimum functioning where you have enough stress to motivate you, but we want to prevent it from tipping over into that orange and red zone. We don't want you to get to the stage where you start to feel exhausted, where you get burnt out and where you start to be affected by anxiety and depression. So it's really important to know where you are on the stress curve and how to prevent yourself from moving into those red zones. Okay? So then let's have you do a personal stress audit. When you are experiencing distress, when you feel as though the challenges you have are exceeding the resources you have available and you're not sure if you're gonna cope, how do you respond? How will you know when you're stressed? Do you get anxious? And that's the, pretty much the most common response to stress. We worry, we get anxious. Some people also respond with anger and irritation and irritability. Some people get aggressive. Some people get apathetic. So they uh, don't really feel any which way about it. Some people get depressed. Some people have difficulty staying calm and they feel tense all the time. So which one of these do you experience? There are other domains, however, that stress can have an effect on us. So another one is the cognitive domain. So when you are stressed, do you find it hard to concentrate? Maybe your attention and focus starts to lap. Uh, maybe you have difficulty processing information and you find yourself getting a little disoriented or more easily confused. So stress can also take an impact or have an impact on our cognitive functioning. The third domain is that stress can affect us physically as well. So if you've been finding that you've been experiencing more headaches, more muscle tension, more aches and pains, even though you haven't done anything or you can't find a cause for it, maybe you're feeling exhausted all of the time. Even after you've slept and rested, you still wake up and you feel fatigued. Are you having indigestion, toothaches, constipation, uh, stomach issues? So all of these are possible effects of stress as well. And you know what? Stress can also exacerbate or take a toll on any existing medical conditions you may have. So it's important to ask yourself whether some of these symptoms you're experiencing may be the result of stress. And finally, stress can also take a toll on our social uh, functioning and on our behaviors. So have you been getting into more arguments? Maybe you're a little more short-tempered with your friends and your loved ones. Maybe you've been isolating yourself and avoiding and withdrawing uh, from activities with others. So notwithstanding our social restrictions right now, maybe you've been finding yourself not wanting to do anything, go anywhere, talk to anybody. That could also be the result of stress. Maybe you've been procrastinating. You find it hard to buckle down and get tasks done. Maybe it's affected your appetite or your sleep. Maybe you're using more substances, alcohol, nicotine, marijuana, or other things. So stress can also take a toll. So recap with me. Remember those four domains. There was the psychological, the cognitive, the physical, and then the social or behavioral. So hopefully you're getting an idea of which are the ways you respond to stress or are affected by stress. But you know what? The stress response and stress reactions are subjective and they're variable. So what that means is that there's no one way to respond to stress. And because you are not responding how other people might respond, that doesn't mean that you are any less stress. And vice versa, because somebody else is not reacting how you are reacting, it doesn't mean that they are not stressed. So people react differently and they react with different intensities. So now that we know that we are all experiencing heightened levels of stress, 
and that we can be affected in different ways by stress and it can affect us in different intensities, we know that stress is inevitable. But you know what? While stress might be inevitable, burnout or the effects of negative stress is very preventable. So let's focus a little bit now on how we can prevent the negative effects of stress. So, and maybe this might be the first quiz question you get in medical school. So have a think about this. Your family has a strong history of diabetes and hypertension. What do you do? Hmm. So many of us in Trinidad and Tobago, across the Caribbean, wherever you are from, many of us may have family history. We know somebody in our family who has diabetes and maybe they have hypertension. And what do you do? So if I know it runs in my family, hmm, then I might be more aware of my heightened risk. I might be aware that my family might have a genetic predisposition, a biological predisposition. And so I have to be aware that this might put me at heightened risk. So maybe I need to be more careful about my diet. Maybe I need to be careful about my lifestyle, uh, my activities, how much exercise I get, etc. So it's about being aware and then figuring out what to do about it. So hopefully you were thinking along those lines too. So here's another question for you. Your program or discipline has a high risk of stress and burnout. What do you do? So you heard it from Dr. Reed. You heard it from uh, other colleagues uh, uh, during this week. This profession, this discipline that you've chosen comes with a high risk of stress and burnout. But that does not mean that it's inevitable. So what do you do? Well, first, you have to be aware, as we said, that this risk does exist. And then you have to make sure you have this repertoire of coping and resilience that's going to get you through it and help you navigate it successfully. So think, let this be you on the road uh, through the Faculty of Medical Sciences at UE. And what we hope you end up with at the end of this journey is that you end up with a good healthy sense of well-being that you have good resilience and that you demonstrate adaptive coping. But you know what? Medical students are at high risk for depression, anxiety, and substance use. So you have to be very careful. You don't get derailed off of this road onto the path of poor mental health. You also have to be careful. You get, don't get derailed off the road where you get frustrated and you're stressed out. And you know what? You start breaking beach. So you start skipping your online classes or you log in, but you're not really there and you're not really listening. So it's presenteeism, but you're not actively engaged in the class. Or maybe, unfortunately, uh, we're still in school and education and sometimes stress can lead students to do awful things like cheating. And that can have really serious consequences for you as a student. So we have to be careful then that you don't get derailed off your path to these things. So what then do we have for you? So we are very concerned about your welfare at the UE. We want to support you in the best way to help you achieve your goals. That's a shared goal for us because your success is our success. So we are invested in your well-being. And so the UE has many, many different facilities and services to help you with that. And you would have been hearing about these all week. So we have the Academic Support and Disabilities Liaison Unit. You heard Dr. Reed mention academic advising and mentoring. And you heard about the fantastic experience Nirvana had in her first year of mentoring. So hopefully one of you listening on today, you're going to be the student who gives a nice testimony to next year's group of first year students. We have the Deputy Principal's Office. And the UE has been responding to this, some of the specific stresses of the pandemic. So, for example, if you're in need of a laptop or a device to help you, you can get one on loan for free. And you do that by emailing the deputy principal's office. You have the student life and development department. You have financial advisory services department. They can help you figure out financing and paying your tuition 
They also have a special section for scholarships and bursaries. There's a counseling and psychological services. So if you need that support and extra boost to help you cope, we have CAPS and we also have peer counselors. And this is not an exhaustive list. I just put as many as I could onto this graphic uh, without making it too crowded. So we do have a lot of resources for you and we do encourage you. They are there for you to utilize whenever you need them. As we said, hopefully these things help you as well as your own efforts to that path of well-being, resilience, adaptive coping, and success. So then, let's talk about some of these tips that you can employ to help you cope with your own stress levels in a very adaptive and healthy way. But first of all, you know what? Let's acknowledge that while some level of stress is healthy, we don't want stress levels to an extent where it's overwhelming us. So that is not normal. So if you realize that you're feeling like you can't cope and that it is too much for you to deal with, you're getting so frustrated, it's starting to affect your functioning, that is not normal. And that should not be tolerated. You don't have to deal with that or accept that as part of life at medical school. No, no, no. If your stress is getting to those levels, you need to send that stress a little breakup message. And let's figure out how you can do that effectively. So one thing we have to realize is that wellness uh, comes in many domains. So while now you're embarking on your tertiary education, you might think that pursuing your schooling and that your education is the most important thing. And certainly it's a great priority, but there are other aspects to your functioning that are also really important. And if you get the right balance, guess what? This can actually boost your educational performance. So remember, you have a physical side, a spiritual side, an emotional side, and a social side. And those can help improve your functioning in the occupational and intellectual sides. So here we go with some tips to help you now achieve this balance. So the first one, in light of everything that's going on, guess what? Communication is key. So I know you've heard this elsewhere, so let me reinforce it here as well. Check your UE email frequently. That's how the university is going to communicate with you. There are other avenues as well in terms of the website, the official social media accounts. So if you're on Facebook, if you're on Twitter, like the pages as well. So the Faculty of Medical Sciences has a very active faculty page. So you can go on to Facebook find the Faculty of Medical Sciences page and give it a like and keep up to date and abreast. Use your virtual learning environment. So as you start to navigate it, I want you to see this just as how at some point you would have figured out how to navigate an app on your phone or take something like Netflix. I'm sure many of us are Netflix users and you can figure out how to navigate and find what you want. I want you to take that same approach to using the virtual learning environment that we have for you. Blackboard Collaborate, that's where you're going to find information about your courses, uh, how to submit assignments, you're going to have your lectures through there. And it's going to be a much more um, pleasant experience for you if you can navigate that successfully. And you know what, if you're having some difficulty doing that, there's help for you as well. So feel free to ask for help if you're struggling with any of this. So the next one is to stay connected. Now, the thing about having these online sessions is that sometimes you can feel a little bit distant and you can feel a little bit isolated. Now, I assure you that like my other colleagues who are going to be teaching you, we try, we do our best to encourage engagement and interaction in our online sessions. But I want you to be wary that you don't start to get too isolated. Because remember, with this pandemic, it's about physical distancing, not social distancing. So keep those lines of communication open and make sure you have regular check-ins with your peers and friends and your mentors and your family. So one of the, the good things about 
the students at UE is that you all find ways to stay connected. You'll have your WhatsApp groups and you can check in with each other. You can crowdsource solutions. So if you're having difficulty finding something, just ask somebody in the chat and I'm sure they'll be willing to help you. And then if you're not sure, check in with the faculty, check in with the dean's office, check in with your advisor, check in with your mentor, but stay connected. And then this is a really important one. Now, one of the things this pandemic has done is it has brought a lot of uncertainty. And it means that not just uncertainty, but everything's changing so fast. So as soon as you adapt to something, the situation changes and now you have to readapt. So in light of that uncertainty, what can help you maintain a sense of control is if you take control over the things you can. So for example, maintaining a routine. So I do encourage you to have a timetable, set up a schedule, and then slot in all of the activities. So you have classes, study time, uh, your leisure, your time with your family, time to eat, time to rest, time to play with your pets, time to sleep. I encourage you to try and maintain a routine and stick to it as much as possible. That structure is going to help you manage your stress in face of all this uncertainty and use the technology to help you. So for example, um, one of the things I found in the pandemic is I don't remember things uh, as, as easily or effectively as I think I would. So I have taken to making sure I use my phone, the calendar on my phone, and I slot meetings in, classes in. I also make notes on the phone. And sometimes I use good old pen and paper and I jot down a to-do list for the day. And then I take a lot of pleasure in crossing off those items as I've achieved them. So whatever the means, if you have a whiteboard that you want to write on, if you like to use a notebook or a diary, if you like to use your phone, whichever you fancy, utilize it and let it help you maintain and keep the routine. The next tip, and oh dear, I think my numbering is off on this tip, uh, is about self-care. So while you are now embarking on to, you're going to, there's going to be pressure to keep up with everything, a lot of studying, a lot of new information, a lot of adjusting. In order to help you cope with that, your self-care is going to be critical. So you have to remember to take a moment to relax, take a moment to de-stress, take a moment to do something fun. Uh, and I use this maxim everywhere and with everybody. When I'm speaking to students, fellow colleagues, fellow health workers, fellow psychologists, the general public, parents, uh, anyone, you can't pour from an empty cup. And this is an especially useful lesson for you as future doctors. You are embarking in a profession where you don't just give uh, in terms of your technical skills, you give of yourself. So your bedside manner, your rapport, how you interact with patients uh, also has an impact on their positive health outcomes. So you need to take care of yourself in order to help take care of others as well. So remember that and picture it. You can't pour from an empty cup. So you need to find ways to recharge your cup. So what do you do for fun? Do you garden? Do you cook? Do you draw? Do you dance? So make sure that you're finding a way to take care of yourself as well. So this is one way that you could take care of yourself, but it's so important that I felt this deserved a slide of its own. Exercise, exercise, exercise. There is so much evidence for the importance of exercise, not just for physical health, but also equally important for mental health. So exercise is critical for your well-being. And let's adapt. So if you can't go to the gym as you usually would have, do it at home. Find a space where you can get a little exercise in. So what, does the, what do the guidelines say is enough exercise? So usually I would have paused and asked you to tell me, but I'm going to give you it. So it's half an hour a day for at least five days a week. Okay. So how many of us are getting that amount in? 
So I'll hold up my hand. I'm a little bit guilty. I don't always get it in. But you know what? The next day I'm going to try to get it in. And if you can't fit in the half hour all in one block, break it up. So maybe 15 minutes in the morning, 15 in the evening. But it's really important for you to get exercise for your mental health. And go at a pace that is suitable for you. So no, we don't expect you to run up Chancellor Hill the first. You'll learn how to share time you try to exercise. So work at your own pace, choose something that's very doable and start off with those small gains until you get to a point where it's consistent. This having a nice exercise routine is also going to help you de-stress throughout medical school. So if you have those great habits already, that's fantastic. If you're like me and you need to increase it a bit, start now so that you can build that and it can take you throughout medical school. My next tip is to stop comparing yourself. How many of you are guilty of this? Perhaps you were doing it in school, comparing yourself to another student. Maybe you do it with your friends and you think about who's smarter than you, who is more articulate, who um, does better. But you know what? Comparisons are never fair because we never, they usually bias because we never actually quite have all of the information to make fair comparisons. So you know what? Other people might be awesome, but you are awesome too. So avoid that tendency to want to compare yourself because usually when we compare, we think we fall short and that can affect your self-esteem, that can affect uh, your self-efficacy. So remember that there is room enough for everybody to be awesome at UE. There's room enough for all of you to be awesome doctors in this medical school and throughout the whole faculty. So no matter what you are pursuing, you can be the best at what you do by your standards. And who are the perfectionists amongst us? You know yourself, those of you who nitpick, those of you who set very high standards for yourself. So this one talks about being wary of your perfectionistic traits. Perfectionism is usually associated with some rigidity and some inflexibility. And especially now we're in this, we're in this pandemic and we may have to be uh, flexible and we may have to adapt to changes and things may not always go as planned, then be very wary that your overly high standards may actually be a barrier. So guess what? We want you to aspire to greatness. We want you to succeed and fulfill your highest potential. But be wary of when your perfectionism can cause you to focus too much on the small stuff. And then you can't see the forest for the trees. Okay? So have a think about that one. And then I referenced this earlier, but here it is again. We want you to be well-rounded medical students. Some of the most successful doctors are also successful at many other things. They have a lot of passions. They have a lot of interests outside of medicine. So guess what? Sometimes you think that medical school, you need to buckle down and that's your only focus, but you can have a life. And so this picture here is actually one of our recent UWE grads his name is Edson Brady, and he's a national uh, and international Taekwondo champion. So you can be a fantastic, amazing uh, medical student. You can be a fantastic vet, pharmacist, optometrist, nursing student. You can be the best at what you do in the Faculty of Medical Sciences, but you should also have other interests. So find something that you enjoy that takes no more than say one hour a day and make sure you're doing that as well. So I mentioned some of those earlier. So what are your interests? Uh, are you into art? Are you a fantastic chef? Do you sing? Do you play an instrument? So cultivate those interests as well. And you know what? It's actually going to make you a better uh, practitioner at the end of the day. And the second to last one, live in awe. 
So sometimes when we're under stress, then we just think, okay, I just need to get through this. And we lose sight of all the other things around us. We lose sight of the passion that we may have had for things. So I like this quote from Einstein. I have no special talents. I'm only passionately curious. But his passionately curious led to him being an amazing human being. So never lose your wonder and your awe and your curiosity. So while you're reading, while you're in your lectures, let your thoughts, let it inspire you. Go and seek out other information that can nurture that passion you have. Remember why you wanted to study medicine, all of those interests you had, and keep that sense of curiosity. You know how little children get excited when they have a new toy or when they're learning about something they like? Let's take a page from their book and let's, let's make sure we don't lose that childish passion or interest for the things that we are doing. And finally, I want to encourage you to think positively. So there are going to be other things that on a daily basis that will stress you out. And I want you to be wary of losing your hope, uh, losing your sense of optimism. So there's also a body of research that talks about the benefits of thinking positive. And a positive mind often produces a positive reality. So if the time comes when you feel frustrated and you feel like quitting, make sure you have a strategy. Think about why you started. Think about what your goal and your dream is. Think about 10 years from now when you'll be talking and reminiscing about the stories of how you started medical school online. So keep it positive. And finally, remember, you have this. You can do this. You've got this. Five years from now, you're going to be, or four years, depending on your program, uh, you are going to be a proud pelican. You are going to endorse and embody the motto of our university, Oriens ex Occidente Lux, a light rising from the West. So keep this in mind. That's going to be you, a proud pelican one day. And hopefully you're going to do this with a great sense of well-being and resilience, managing your stress and achieving the best that you're capable of. So I thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions or comments, I'm quite happy to answer them. And I'll hand back over um, to our moderator. Okay, Dr. Khan, we have no questions for you at this time. So we would like to thank you very much for your presentation for that whole segment on academic advising. Dr. Reed, Ms. Dipna Ryan, Dr. Khan, we extend our gratitude to you. And up next on our segment, we have an overview of PEC, and this is going to be delivered by Dr. Farid Youssef from the Department of Preclinical Sciences. Dr. Youssef, I welcome you this morning to talk about PEC. Okay, you are on mute, so we will ask you to just unmute. Great. Thanks, Rihanna. And um, let me welcome all of our new first year students. Well, this is quite an experience. And um, you are the pioneers. You are the ones who are going first. Um, if, I'm, if I was in your shoes, I'm not even sure if I would be uh, actually listening to myself after having to do three days of online already. Uh, so the world is different. The world is new. Uh, things are changing around us. And pioneers, um, sometimes it can be difficult, but it's a world of great opportunity. So let me just take uh, this opportunity to welcome you and say how glad we are to have you here at the Faculty of Medical Sciences. I'm really, really, really disappointed that I can't see your faces. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing your faces in the not too distant future. Uh, but for the time being, uh, we're going to discover uh, how to make this work. And we're going to discover uh, new possibilities and new things that are going to emerge 
inside of this space of online uh, university. So I'm gonna try and share my screen now. So if you just give me a minute, I'm usually quite good at these things. So I'm gonna do share screen and get my PowerPoint and click there. So I'm hoping uh, that uh, you are seeing that. Uh, but one of the things I've learned very quickly about the online world is there are going to be little gaps, there are going to be little issues. And I know if you're not seeing it, you're going to put something on YouTube, the whole world is going to see that, and then Rihanna is going to come back and tell me. The fact that I haven't gotten any uh, feedback from Rihanna so far means I think we're on track and we're moving forward. So I'm just going to give you a very, very brief introduction to your program in professionalism, ethics, and communications in health. Let me begin by saying that um, this might be uh, one of the courses that you pay least attention to. Uh, so I'm seeing a chat coming up. Oh, Rihanna was just letting me know that you all are seeing the presentation. Yeah, this is one of the courses you may uh, pay least attention to, um, but in many ways, it may be one of your more important courses. Um, next week, I'm going to ask you a question, and it's going to be a very, very important question. I'm not going to preempt that question now, but the things that we're going to discuss over the next two years for most of you and over the lifetime of your career at UE related to professionalism, ethics, and communications are really going to determine a lot about your future. And so I know the tendency is you want to be a vet, and so you want to get into everything that it has to do with animals and taking care of them. Uh, you like optometry, you like physics, you like the principles of light, and that one's, that's what really excites you. But essentially, all of us, uh, what we're involved in is we're involved in working with people or working with other living beings. Uh, and that's your primary responsibility. Your primary responsibility is to a human being. Your primary responsibility, uh, now you've come into university, is to think beyond yourself and to think into the wider society that you're now going to serve. And that's what we're gonna look at and trying to discuss in the courses in professionalism, ethics, and communication. Uh, so I'm looking forward to working with you, and I'm looking forward to uh, discovering uh, your future together. So this is a brave new world. Uh, things are changing all around us. If I asked you last year, what do you think your first day of university would like? I can guarantee, I am pretty much sure, not one of you would have described it as is happening today. So things can change rapidly in the world. And we have to be able to adapt and we have to be able to change and we have to be able to see new hope and new possibility inside of that. And as far as professionalism, ethics and communications uh, goes, one of the things that is happening inside of this COVID pandemic and inside of everything that's taking around us is we're having an immersion experience, COVID immersion experience. You are getting to live and to observe real-time decisions that health professionals have to make, real-time decisions and uh, uh, consequences based upon choices that are actually affecting you. Right now, health professionals are have to weigh up personal individual rights versus public good. Right now, health professionals have to consider their own safety, even as they're trying to take care of patients around them, as nurses interact with patients, as doctors interact with patients, as dentists have to uh, deal with their patients. And so if you look at COVID-19 and this current pandemic through the lens of professionalism, ethics, and communication, what you can discover is it's a tremendous learning opportunity for you, a tremendous learning opportunity for you to think about uh, what does it mean to be a health professional. And so that's the first thing I want to ask you to do. I want you to ask, I want to ask you to step back 
And don't just think about how is the pandemic uh, affecting you personally, how it's changed your expectations, but use the lens of the pandemic to think about what kind of professionals am I seeing in operation and how is that going to shape me going forward? I just want to uh, uh, share a little video here that just gives you a very real look into the issues being faced by health professionals in this pandemic. So I'm just gonna, if you give me a second, I just wanna set up something on Zoom to make sure that the sound is well taken care of. I'm stopping share. Uh, get that there. Optimizing screen, coming back to sharing with you. And hopefully now we can get that going. Honestly, guys, it felt like I was working in a war zone. I have some tears and crying right now because I'm so tired. A life saved from COVID-19 requires others accepting the risk of self-sacrifice. For me to say I don't feel fear going into a room or anxiety, that my heart doesn't start pounding and my, my stomach doesn't turn is... A lie. Canadian nurse Susan Sorrenti knows better than most the price of caring for highly infectious patients. In 2003, she contracted SARS while working at a Toronto hospital. She was then hospitalized for 17 days. That experience was devastating to me. Without, I, I don't think without any kind of psychological help, I could have gone through it. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a common side effect of working on the medical front lines. Yeah. Luke Labasse is an ER doctor in New Orleans, treating an influx of COVID patients in addition to the routine cases of shootings and stabbings. There's no way to come out of this normal, uh, you know, at least not having something kind of affecting your psyche. And that's even before the pandemic started. Now, with the coronavirus overwhelming some North American hospitals, medical staff face the additional trauma of working without professional protective gear and soon may have to choose who lives and who dies. We're putting our own families at risk. And so when we then, quote unquote, pull the plug on somebody, it's hard to think about, well, is my is my elderly mother who lives with me going to be in this situation a week from now? Am I going to be the doctor that makes this decision for her? Mental health experts say an entire generation of medical workers will likely suffer prolonged psychological effects from working through this pandemic. But that hasn't stopped Sorrenti, the nurse who survived SARS, from extending her 27-year career a bit longer to meet the need. I was actually scheduled to retire um, in June, which I postponed because it's like, well, I can't walk out now. In the meantime, communities coming together to thank hospital workers are daily reminders of the public's appreciation for their compassion, perseverance, and bravery. Heidi Jo Castro, Al Jazeera, Washington. Excellent. So just those last uh, words there give you some insight into what we might be thinking about inside of our PEC program, uh, compassion. Uh, bravery, uh, someone deciding to extend their career uh, to help serve others. Uh, at the same time, you see some of the challenges that are going to be faced uh, and you need to consider as a health professional. Uh, what are your risks as you have to go out and take care of others? Uh, are there going to be choices about who has to live and die if we don't have enough resources? And so there's a whole host of things that you need to be thinking about now because you are now growing up. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a quotation in the Bible uh, that I think is useful to think about as you step into university. Uh, and I'm not putting this out there uh, from a religious perspective. I'm just saying it's something for us to think about. And that uh, Bible says that uh, when I was a child, I, I thought as a child and I acted as a child. But when I became an adult, uh, I had to think as an adult and I had to act as an adult. Uh, and this movement into university for most of you is a time of transition. And in this course, uh, you are going to be challenged to think and act like a professional and to understand what that means 
Uh, and the COVID pandemic is providing a lens for us to look into that. Here's a quotation from an online newspaper. Uh, why would a slight 79-year-old physician stand up to a volatile, combative president? Why do millions of healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, emergency responders, aid, transport specialists, and more risk their lives every day to care for those with COVID-19, a potentially deadly infection? Personal courage is part of the explanation, but there's more to it than that. What we're seeing is the professionalism of people like Anthony Fauci, and thousands of healthcare workers. The essence of their professionalism is they put the interests of the patients and the public before their own. And we have to discuss that in this program. We have to consider what that means. We have to think about what that means for your life and what that means for my life. And it raises many, many questions, uh, many things to think about. And I want you to start thinking about these things now as you begin that transition from being a high school student for many of you and now becoming a professional and fulfilling the dreams that many of you had. So questions like I've raised already, how do you balance acceptable personal risk with a duty to care? Uh, it's a difficult question if you don't have PPE, uh, but you're still required to care. For yeah. How do you protect patient privacy while achieving transparency? That's a question we've seen often asked here in Trinidad. Uh, the public wants to know who are the COVID-19 patients, who's been tested positive, but patients have a right to confidentiality and a right to privacy. And if you tested positive or your mother tested positive, would you want everybody in Trinidad or the wider Caribbean to know? How do we make difficult decisions about who should get care when resources are limited? Uh, and there were questions about numbers of ventilators and things like that. But that's a question that comes up in other situations as well. And then as we have to deal with COVID-19, uh, how do we allocate general health care resources? Because while a pandemic is raging, uh, people are still have diabetes. There's still emergency situations in the hospital. And all of these things have to be managed. These are the things that we want to explore in the PEC program. And behind all of that, how do we effectively and with empathy communicate to our patients and to the public at large? So for the year one students, and now I'm speaking uh, specifically uh, to our MBBS students, our DDDS students, our dental students, our pharmacy students, and our optometry students, uh, because you are the ones who are taking the PET courses. Uh, the nursing students, uh, you deal with these topics uh, in other places in your school. Uh, these are the three courses you'll be doing this year. Uh, the first course, uh, the Health Professional and Society, uh, PEC 1001. Uh, that'll be this semester. And that actually begins this Monday at 10 a.m. So I look forward to seeing you then. Uh, Monday at 10 a.m., uh, I'll be talking to you again. And we really start to deep dive into these things. Uh, next semester, we'll do two courses. One is communication principles for effective healthcare. And then we have a practicum. Uh, and we'll explain more to you about that practicum later in the semester. So I'm going to wrap up now. And I'm just going to leave you with a quotation from Gandhi, who says, be the change that you want to see in the world. Or be a role model. Be an example. And as you have stepped into the Faculty of Medical Sciences, you have stepped into a leadership role. You have stepped into the fact that you are now a professional in training. A few years from now, whether it be three years, four years, or five years, you are going to graduate and you'll officially be a professional. But I want you to think from now, from day one, that I am a professional in training. And if you are a professional in training, you immediately begin to take on the mantle and take on the characteristics and take on that which has been given and granted to you as a privilege to be in this faculty. So I challenge you to become an example, become a leader, and step forward. And these are the things that I look forward to discussing with you uh, during your sojourn through the faculty. Thank you very much. And uh, looking forward to uh, any questions or comments now uh, and working with you in the future.
Okay, Dr. Youssef, I note that we have no comments for you this time on our live. Okay, Rihanna, well, thank you to everyone who is listening to me. And uh, like I said before, I'll see you next week, students. Take care. Okay, students, thank you very much for that. That was our presentation on PEC by Dr. Farid Youssef. Up next, we have a presentation from GATE. I know some of you would have a lot of questions concerning GATE and the bursary and those sorts of information. However, we do have a small intermission, so we would like for you to stay tuned to our live. And in a few moments, you will be seeing a screen after which you can get some information and then we will have our segment on GATE. Congratulations to all new and first year students and welcome to your first year experience at the UWI St. Augustine campus. What an important choice you have made to pursue higher education and what better way to do so than to hashtag BUE. Joining us at the St. Augustine campus signals your desire to achieve excellence and represent the trust you have placed in us as an institution to help you grow, develop, and achieve both your academic and personal goals. We thank you for entrusting us with this important responsibility and are excited to start this partnership with you. I bring you greetings on behalf of the entire team at the Division of Student Services and Development, otherwise known as the DSSD, your strategic partners in learning, development, and student success. As your partners, we want you to know that our collective team of eight departments regard your well-being as priority. As such, we work to provide you with a positive, integrated, and holistic educational experience throughout your university journey. We recognize the diversity of our student population and strive, therefore, to cater to your individual needs through a wide range of programs, developmental opportunities, and support services. These include career guidance and management, accommodation, student leadership, academic support, counseling, financial aid, disability support, student activities and events, student employment and community engagement. Please know that these offerings are all accessible and important to you achieving a well-rounded university experience. Your first year of university is a particularly important milestone of your student life and it lays the foundation for success and creates the rhythm for the unfolding of your campus life experience. The FYE program, therefore, is developed specifically for you to meet informational demands, acclimatize you to your new university environment, and help you get comfortable as you prepare for the exciting student journey that lie ahead. Through FYE, we assure you that you will be supported every step of the way as you navigate your new reality. Orientation activities and events have been organized for you and a comprehensive orientation module have been prepared. This educational exercise is delivered in short and engaging video lessons that will be made available to you all semester long via the student portal. We encourage you to take full advantage of this invaluable orientation resource. Students, your time at the university is your canvas to create beautiful and rewarding experiences and to develop holistically. 
at the DSSD, we are excited to welcome you and to have the opportunity to help you achieve your goals while transforming your life positively and providing you with an enriching student experience. We congratulate you on the start of your journey to becoming a game changer and encourage you to connect with us as we work together in achieving the extraordinary. students and we are back. Thank you very much for that presentation from the Division of Student Services, letting you know that they are here to serve. Up next, we have Mr. Adil Mohammed, who is the president of the Medical Sciences Student Council. Adil Mohammed is a 22 year old year four MBBS student who is passionate about cosmology, philosophy, humanitarian activities and health and fitness. He's the current Medical Sciences Student Council chairperson and the UE St. Augustine Guild Faculty of Medical Sciences representative. He aims to enter the world of neurosurgery and in doing so, bring benefits to the lives of others tries to live his life by a quote from one of his favorite cosmologists, Carl Sagan. It underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Thank you very much. I now hand over to you, Mr. Mohammed. Students, if you have questions for Mr. Mohammed, please note that you can type them in the chat and we will respond as soon as we get the chance. Mr. Mohammed, it's all yours. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, so my name is Adam Mohammed, and I am the Faculty of Medical Sciences representative, as well as the president of the Medical Sciences Student Council, right? So I'm just going to start. I, I prepared a little presentation for you all here today. So I'm just going to share it. Ooh. Apologies for the background noises. Okay, um, I'm not entirely sure how to start with that thing, but we'll go with it. All right, so I just wanted to say first and foremost, welcome. Welcome to the Faculty of Medical Sciences. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all here. And I do want to say that despite all the, all the um, horror stories you all may have heard from your friends and your colleagues in higher years or whatever, being in the Faculty of Medical Sciences is truly a blessing. And to be in the Faculty of Medical Sciences at UEC Dillerson has been honestly one of the greatest experiences of my life. And I'm so, so blessed to have been able to be a part of this experience. So this first slide here just shows you um, how our current faculty logo looks like. Um, this is what was chosen by the students. We actually had a vote on it. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit. I'm, I'm going to go into the boring stuff first, and I'll just get into that. And then I'll go on to the more interesting stuff that you all really care to hear about, right? So um, what is the Medical Sciences Student Council, right? And what is basically student representation in FMS? Well, the Medical Sciences Student Council is essentially basically the, the bridge um, of communication between the students and the administration or the faculty. So our, our function, our goal is really to ensure that we have proper student involvement in planning and decision making in policy making in our faculty so that we could basically have student centered approaches to how it is our curriculum is delivered and everything else. Um, with Hold on just a second, please, guys. Ah, this is how you do it, okay. All right, cool. Great, sorry about that. Yes, so what is the MSSE, right? So basically we facilitate that sort of communication and represent the students on all levels, be it at the departmental levels, at the faculty levels, or at the level of the wider university, right? 
Um, under the MSSC, we have um, six different organizations, one for each department or school in Faculty of Medical Sciences. So here you can see we have the Veterinary Science um, Students Association, VSAT. We have TTANS, which is for nursing students. We have TTOSA for optometry students. We have DSAT for dental students. We have TTOPS for pharmacy students. And we have TTMSA for the medical students. And all of these associations fall under the umbrella of the Medical Sciences Student Council. So basically we're just here to make sure that your voices are heard and that you all are basically activated and that you all can voice your opinions properly and you have the proper channels to do so and that it reaches where it needs to be heard and is properly heard and received. Um, in addition to the academic aspect of the MSSE, we also have a little bit more aspects, um, such as the student life and student voice, which are two new teams that were added. And the student life and student voice are basically just there to improve the student quality and the student experience in Mount Hope. Um, the student voice is basically a campaign platform to allow students to have that opportunity to, to raise their voices and, and speak out on issues that they deem that they would want to speak out on, such as um, mental health awareness or, or sexual health education, all of those kind of stuff. Um, the student life team is basically um, consisting of all the club presidents of the um, different clubs in MedSci. And we have a lot, a lot of clubs in MedSci, right? So that's one thing you all can look forward to is the, the clubs. And I know now you all might be thinking, okay, we're going into this like online delivery or this COVID period, but Trust me and, uh, when I say that things will normalize eventually and when they do, you all have a lot to look forward for, a lot, a lot to look forward to. Um, another big um, thing that we do in MedSci is a lot of outreach. Um, so we have the MSSC outreach team. And the thing is, if you're interested in charity work, and I think a lot of you would be because I mean, you're in the faculty of medical sciences, right? You're, you're going to be a future healthcare professional. And I think a lot of the persons who come in into our faculty are really selfless people and they care about just helping out and being your brother's keeper and looking out for each other. And that's a big thing. So within FMS, we have so many different clubs that are focused on basically just um, outreach and charity work and all of that. One of the biggest clubs that does that actually is the Leadership Council. So we have, we have a lot of different clubs in MedSci and we have a lot of diversity. So really and truly, whatever it is you're looking for, we probably have it here. If, if it is you, you want to find talent, we have a real talent in MedSci. One of the, the biggest things um, in MedSci right now is the Diwali play. I don't know if I'll ever hear about the Meds Diwali play. It's one of the best performances you will ever see, um, especially since it's be live hunting. So that's something really that you all could look forward to eventually. Um, another thing would be the Christmas play, which is held by the MSSE outreach team now. Um, and the Christmas play is just be a pure vibe, like honestly, when it is, you go into the amphitheater and the whole, how the Christmas play is, why, why it's held by the outreach team is because it's actually a charity thing. Um, we invite some foster student, um, foster children to come and just have a good time. We, we give them some Christmas gifts and we just put on a, a show for them. And it's really a, really a nice vibe. Um, we, we have the clubs like the Leadership Council that host events like Need to Feed, and um, and visits to the home for the elderly, those kind of stuff. So if you're always interested in that, you could you could hear about that from the leadership council. Um, we also have a very big big thing in religion. Um, we have Juma on every Friday, and we have satsangs almost every week usually um, during the normal con convening of things. Um, so we have the Mount Hope Islamic Society, and we have the Intervarsity Christian Fellowship. Um, so if you all are religious or you, you wish to expound on your religious proficiency, you all can um, be sure to get into those, those clubs and find out what they're about and um, be a part of it. This is actually a very recently formed club, the African Student Union. Um, a lot of students felt like it was very necessary and um, a year two MBBS student actually started this club. Um, she, she spoke to the guild and she organized for the formation of the African Student Union. So I don't know much about where they will be going, but you all can be sure to look out for that and some events coming up from them, virtual events and whatnot. Um, the FMS Safe Base is really just a, a club that is focused on the mental health of the student and promoting 
equity and equality among persons of all genders, sexualities, etc. The equine club is actually a derivative of vet school. Um, so if you're all interested in your horses and you want to get to know about them and everything, you can check out the equine club. We have Mount Hope Surgical Society. Um, this is also a, a pretty new club. This one and the pathology club are also pretty new clubs. They were only formed like last month or so, maybe within this year at least. Um, so we could definitely look forward to a lot of virtual events from those two clubs as well. Um, the Rotaract Club actually has this project going on right now called Project Hope, which is basically to raise awareness against suicide and um, mental health. And it's always, always a good thing to see from the Rotaract Club. Um, but yeah, so that, and well, we have the Bahamian Students Association for all the regional students as well. We have a lot of other clubs and um, everything in Mount Hope. And really and truly when it is you guys come into Mount Hope, it's, it's one thing I want to impart on you all today is basically, I, I, I would say this, um, you all are coming into a very prestigious um, faculty, right? Uh, prestigious in quotation marks, but prestigious faculty. And when, when I say that, I, I mean to say that you all are going to have a lot of work to do. I'm not going to deny that being in FMS is not necessarily the easiest thing, but it's the decision we've made. It's the decision we've made. However, if it is you, you want to get involved in other things, please do. Right, you, you you will find the time. Once it is you're interested in something, once it is you want to be a part of something, you will make the time for it once you once you want to. And that's one thing I want to impart on you all is don't just sit down by your desks all day and and study study a textbook 24/7. Now, whilst that's good, yes, and you need to become a professional doctor or, or nurse or, or vet or whatever. But be become involved. Make the most of your university experience, right? Because for most of us, we only really get that experience once in our lifetimes. And I, I just want you all to be able to enjoy it as much as possible. Um, so with that being said, welcome to FMS. Um, I, I would actually open up the floor to any questions now. And um, I would invite you all to uh, this that we're having next week um, from Monday, September 14th, the MSSE will be hosting a, a student run um, basically introduction to FMS. Um, we'll be introducing you all to the different associations, the student associations. Um, we'll be introducing you all to the different clubs. Any questions you all have, you all could feel free to ask. We wouldn't put any time limits on it or anything. So it's just basically an open forum for us to chat and get to know each other from the higher years to the lower years, uh, well, the incoming students, right? So yeah, I'll, I'll open up now for any questions. If anybody has any questions they would like to ask, um, you all can feel free. Um, so somebody asked where or how can we connect with international students that are part of the MedSci faculty? Well, um, we have a, that's, that's one thing I, I like, I love about MedSci is the fact that we have so much diversity in MedSci. We have a lot of international and regional students. You can find students, and I'm not just saying regional, international. You can find students from India. You can find students from Canada. You can find students from literally almost anywhere, right? Um, so those, those um, students, we, we interact with them through the different um, uh, regional and international student associations, such as the Bohemian Students Association, there's a Guyanese Students Association, and so on and so forth. Um, somebody asked how to join these clubs. So y'all could um, reach out on the Instagram pages. Y'all can probably message me on Instagram if you want, at adel underscore jake or at mssc underscore fms. And um, we will try to get to you about that. I'm not sure if my time is up as yet or not. Um, somebody asked, what is the Mount Hope Surgical Society about? So the Mount Hope Surgical Society is basically about just fostering that love for surgery that a lot of students have, um, getting people involved or interested in what surgery is about, educating them about it, um, maybe trying to facilitate some observerships and whatnot. So that's definitely a club if you're interested in surgery from now, it's something good to, to join and get to know a little bit about where you want to go with life, yeah? So I think that's it for the questions. Um, I'll hand you all over back to Ms. Ramitas. Thank you very much, Adil, for that presentation. It was very informative. And now we have Mrs. Loveless from GATE. I know students have a lot of questions pertaining to GATE. 
financial clearance, all that sort of information. So Mrs. Loveless, I now hand over to you where she will be doing a slide presentation and sharing some valuable contact information for you guys. Thank you, Rihanna. Uh, good morning, students. Good morning to all presenters. Um, today, I would like to just say, I hope and trust that you are all well given the COVID-19 pandemic. Students, uh, please stay safe. I am here, I am Mrs. Stephanie Lovelace. I'm a senior investigating officer at the Gate Office, uh, Ministry of Education, or the Funding and Grants Administration Division. I am here to speak to you all briefly about two main programs that are administrated by the Funding and Grants Administration Division. The one that is most critical to all of you students who are new and have accessed or and or have access gate funding before is the GATE program. GATE basically stands for just that, Government Assistance for Tuition Expenses. Got it. I got it. It's working with us. Okay. For students who are nationals of Trinidad and Tobago, there are some basic things that you must understand in order for you to qualify for the GATE program. First and foremost, you must be a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago and must be resident in the country for a minimum of three years prior to the time that you are requesting GATE funding. You must also be fully accepted into the University of the West Indies. In this case, being in the MedSci faculty, you would have gotten a full acceptance for entry into the particular program that you, are, you would have requested. But there's another side to qualifying for GATE which is you, because GATE is strictly online and has been since 2014, students, you must register and obtain an e-service ID at an approved GATE e-service registration center, which in this case would be the TT Connect centers. TT Connect has, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, TT Connect has issued uh, some guidelines for you, the students, to follow in order to access your registration for your e-service ID and beyond. Now, TT Connect service centers are closed until further notice. They have asked that students please do not attempt to visit the office of the TT Connect center simply because you will be caught into, in a bit of a problem. You will be there standing in line. They are not seeing persons. If they do decide to see anyone at all, they are only seeing one person at a time. So my recommendation to you as a new student, if you have not already received your e-service ID number to be able to fill a gate form, follow the guidelines that I'm giving to you now. All documents that I'm going to speak to you about must be submitted via the info.ttconnect.gov.tt email address. One of the first things that they're asking is that you provide them with a computer generated birth certificate, your national ID card, they would like to have that both sides copied and or your passport. I'm saying and or, because sometimes students submit to the TT Connect that uh, the national ID card, and then they submit to us a passport. 
the system will not allow you to register with the to register or fill a gate form with something that is different from what you registered your e-service ID with. TT Connect is also requesting a valid email address and a mobile number. It's important that you recognize that you must provide this type of information because everything is being done online. The next step, the next things that you need to understand students is that the TT Connect is asking you to do some very simple things, three steps. Once you have those documents that I spoke about in the previous slide, you then have to take a photo of your face as in a selfie. They want to see your face showing, you have to hold your national ID card or your passport, whichever one you want to use to register. And this must be submitted as part of your registration process for your e-service ID. You must then scan and label the signed identification documents and the photograph and email it. Again, I'll repeat that email address, info.ttconnect.gov.tt. The TT Connect, they would have said that two days is the average days, amount of days that they would take to process and provide you with a registration with your gate e-service ID. I would say give them three. They are swamped. A lot of emails are coming into them and I'm not too sure whether they are able to meet their two-day timeline. However, please submit your documentation as quickly and as clear as possible so that you can get through. Once you have completed that side of the process and you have received an e-service ID, you, your next step in the gate process is to visit the gate website, use that e-service ID as a login, access the application and complete the form. We are asking kindly that all students provide us with an active email address one that you use frequently, one that is easy for you to access, because the only way we, we contact students during the application process is via an email. All students are also reminded that your applications have deadlines. Within this academic year of study, please ensure that you fill your application form every semester and as required by the university. The bursary is an excellent point of reference. You can contact your bursary. Someone at the bursary will contact, will inform you on what your the process is with regard to the bursary and gate. This takes me to the next point of the gate office. The gate office is currently closed to the public. We are asking students not to visit the gate office. Queries reg regarding your application must be sent via email. I have provided the, the team here at FMS with a list of contact information, a list of names, emails, phone contacts. Mine is included there. If you contact the bursary, more than likely, they would also give you my contact information to contact us in the event of any issues that may arise with your application or during the application process. You have been provided with direct extensions for all officers, and we have given you a guideline as to some of the issues that you may, that might come up and who are the persons that you are supposed to submit those things to so that you will not have too many problems and you will be dealt with within a very short space of time. Only students who are required to reimburse the ministry for one reason or the other would be allowed to enter the compound. It is important that you acknowledge or you understand that the, the security officers are doing their jobs. They have been guided. We all are operating using certain health guidelines, please work with us so that we can assist you as quickly as possible. It takes me then to the point of the application form. 
when you log in and you uh, fill in the application form, everything is laid out as clearly as possible for you, the student. At GATE, we ask you for three types of documents. They are your identity documents, your academic documents, and your means test documents, which I will go through with you in a later slide. For your identity documents, for the females who are married, we ask for a, a marriage certificate or a divorce certificate for those in the case of a divorcee. Your birth, electronic birth certificate, your national ID card back and front, or your passport, that biodata page on your passport is what we're looking for. In the case where we have students who have a name change, where your name is represented differently from your birth certificate, we ask for that deed poll or affidavit as required. Because you are new to the program, and I'm saying new, so maybe you're not new to GATE, but because you're in year one of a new program, we want to see an acceptance letter. All of this information that I'm speaking to you about must be in soft copy and uploaded to the application. Your means test documents, it's a long list. Please visit our FAQs page at the GATE website. The FAQs page provides you with the entire list of, re of required documents so that you, the student, can be guided as to what you need to put in based on your household income status. Documents provided by you, the student, must support the income earners in the household in which you reside. Still, we have had cases where students would have put up the income of one parent, they don't live there, they, they give us all sorts of different information. This prompts your application to go under query. Please provide us with specific information as requested. If we need any additional information, we, we would always send you an email. You must reply within your stipulated time frame. Again, this, if you do not, it puts a delay on your application turnaround time, which then makes you, the student, become anxious and it, it, roll, it takes you into an entire situation that you get anxious, you can't do your work, and it's a whole mess. Just follow the guidelines as they are very simple guidelines. Just follow them as quickly and as easily as you possibly can. Where you are not clear on something, you can send us an email. You are given a notification every action that is taken on the application. Once we identify an error on your application, we send it back to you and we open up the application and we allow you to make the change. In every case, the university, the bursary, when they are checking, they tend to pick up on some because they communicate with us so frequently. They tend to pick up easily on an error made by a student. So you would find that a lot of instances, there are a lot of instances where members of the bursary or your representative at the bursary would send you an email, tell you please contact Mrs. Lovelace at this extension or this email address and let her know that you have an error on your application. And I tend to work on it immediately. You are given 14 days to correct your application students. 14 days. Those days, that's the window of time to correct your application. If you do not do it within that 14 day time frame, this, the system alerts you that your application is going to be canceled by so and so date. Once your application is canceled, you have to go through the entire process all over again. In an effort to prevent yourself from being placed in that kind of precarious situation with the bursary then contacting you telling you you need to come and pay us i would suggest that you keep monitoring your email keep monitoring 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 because we contact you via email all the time you have to be advised as well in this forum 
that when the year has passed, there is a high possibility that you will not be able to make a claim or make an application for the previous year if you never put in a claim. So simply put, try to complete your applications within the current year. The system is normally closed off at the end of the academic year. In your case, August. From September 1, we consider it a new year and you will not be able to make a re what is called a retroactive application. For new students, the assessment is very simple. What we do, it's a basic assessment. We look at, we deal with, we, we assess you based on your letter, your acceptance letter, your gate history. If you were in the system before, then we apply all of the policies that uh, pertain to that particular situation. And we look at the program. In the case of FMS, the programs, the programs within this faculty, they are all pretty much approved for gate funding. So you, you all are pretty clear right now at the start. One of the things I want to highlight at this point is the fact that GATE does not pay for repeat courses, especially for the medical students. I need the medical students to be very conscious of this fact. It's a policy. We will not pay for repeat courses. Once we have paid for a semester in which you have, you would have uh, done that course already, we will not pay for a repeat and once you fail it. For continuing students, the MedSci faculty, I'm sure would have provided you with your guidelines with regard to how you are to be assessed. GATE normally follows the guidelines that, that are provided by the, the medical faculty. And I'm stressing on this because the medical faculty, the, while the, the university might be looking at you under a GPA, we look at you under both a GPA and your pass and fail rating. So those are things that I need you to understand very clearly. Again, if you have any further questions, you are free to ask uh, either in the question and answer forum or you can send me an email. Two critical points based on this information are Students' registration fees and all other amenities that are supposed to be paid by the students are based on the institution. Gate is responsible. Re Gate's responsibility stops at the tuition. So we deal with you on tuition only. That being said, holds that are placed on your account by the bursary may not necessarily have anything to do with gain. So I would ask you to speak to someone at your bursary first before contacting gate regarding an institution hold, an AR hold, a finance hold, whatever type of hold that the bursary has placed on your account, you need to speak to them first. I just wanted to touch very, very briefly on the fact that when you access gate funding, when you say to the ministry that you would like to be given gate funding for your program, you are entering into a contract with the government. There are terms and conditions that you have to understand as well. The contract carries approximately 11 clauses. I have highlighted on the screen just a few more important ones that they would, uh, in terms of how they apply to you, withdrawing from your program, failing to complete your program, transferring from a program into another program, and deciding to take a leave of absence. Those are four critical points that you need to understand that you must provide a letter to the gate office once you are being funded by gate you must provide a letter to the gate of office when you are engaging in any one of these points. They could severely affect your funding as a continuing student or for another program. We take the breach of the student's agreement very, very seriously. 
And I also have to note, and I want to reiterate here that students who are going on a leave of absence from the program, or you have decided that you're not going to complete, you need to inform the gate office. Finally, in terms of the student contract, a student who is a scholarship recipient is not eligible for gate funding. A student who has received scholarship for medicine, pharmacy, DVM, DDS, any of the programs within the, the, within the FMS will not be eligible for gate funding. Even when your contract has ended and you feel that you still, or you have another year to do, GATE will not fund you. It is important that I say this to you upfront so that five years down the road, you don't think that you're gonna get GATE. And this is simply because there's a financial rule within our policies that guide us. And the financial rule states that the student who is the recipient of one grant for, I'm using medicine in this case, one grant shall not be eligible for funding for that same program under another grant. Students, it's important that you understand this so that you do not fall into the problem three, four, five years down the road when you are cut by scholarship, you, you, you want to access GATE. This takes me to the issue of the means test and the means test policy. Again, I would ask you to visit the FAQs page on the GATE website. There is a very detailed um, list of information, but I just wanna highlight a few critical points for you. The means test policy became effective in 2017. It was, it was implemented as a cost sharing method which basically tells us or tells you the student how much money we are going to pay on your behalf to the university. So the gate side, the gate clearance side, because these are terminologies that you would, you would be seeing and hearing along the way in your, in your course of study. Gate clearance basically tells you, okay, you are good and eligible to receive gate funding. But the means test tells you how much money we will pay. We are asking that you ensure that your accurate information is provided to not just to avoid sanctions, and sanctions simply mean that we may stop the funding or we may decide to give you 50% regardless of your situation. But it is also to ensure that we have a quick turnaround time on your application and the processing of the means test. I'm still on the means test because a lot of students, because you, you tr tend not to read everything that pops up on the screen, you make certain errors. And one of the biggest errors that we have encountered is a student who has skipped the means test. The implications of skipping the means test to you, the student, is that you are signaling to us at the ministry that you can afford to pay 50% of your fees. We cannot do anything when you skip the means test. We are not authorized to make changes to your application. I am asking, please, that you, once you decide that you would like to access the means test, because you do have the option, your parents, your family might decide, okay, we can afford to pay 50% or my income is over a certain amount. We will get 50% anyway, we will skip the means test. That's an option that you have available to you, but that's a decision that you must make wisely. When you apply for the means test, please ensure that household income, and the household income refers to all the persons who are living within the household and are employed. One last point on the means test is that the means test rating is for one academic year. So whatever rating that you get in semester one, that's gonna take you into semester two. Only when we are movement or progression into year two or year three of the program as the case may be, 
only then will we then reassess you for means test again. At that point in time, you may have changes in your family situation, etc. That is the time for you to submit to us the information with any changes with regard to your household income. On the screen, I have put up for you an idea. Again, this is stated very clearly on the FAQs page, but it just basically gives you a breakdown of the household income levels that we look at and what you will be eligible for as a student in terms of the funding. Where the household income is $10,000 per month or less, the student will be eligible for 100% of your tuition fees. Now I say eligible because there, uh, we have the case of incomplete applications which will not be processed and students will be required to pay 50% of the tuition. And that would be regardless of whether you, your household income is $10,000 or less, all right? And where the household income is above 10, but less than 30, you become eligible for 75%. And where the household income is above 30,000 per month, the students will be eligible for 50% of tuition fees. The students who do not wish to apply, which is what I mentioned earlier in the previous slide, if you do not wish to apply for means test because it is not mandatory, you will be required to pay 50% of your fees. What happens is that in the application process, if you do not apply for the means test, the application goes directly to the institution once we have processed it for gate clearance, and then the university can just apply the fees and submit the claim thereafter. Very easy. I've just inserted here for you for postgraduate level students, which pretty much um, is also on our FAQs page. So I will not go into too many details on this one, but um, I know once you have reached, you have completed your first level of study, some of you move on to the DM level. So that would be interesting information for you. Um, that pretty much brings me to the end of the, the points regarding the GATE program. Uh, I must highlight here though, that the, the, there is a, another program that is administrated by the Funding and Grants Division. And that program is the HELP. Program. The, the HELP loan program is a low interest student loan that is given through any one of the major four banks. Um, we ask students, please use the facility because it helps you, it covers, it, it is just that, it's a help, it helps you. It covers your tuition fees, your caution fees, your books, your traveling, housing, those kinds of things. It, it takes some of the pressure off of your family in terms of the output, the financial output upfront. There are two things though that you need to know. One is that you, the student, must qualify for GATE in order for you to qualify for the HELP loan. And two, the HELP loan provides you with that facility for the duration of your program. The bank then allows you a six month window to kind of catch yourself. And only after you have successfully completed your program, the bank, six months later, the bank will then call you to start that process of repayment. So it literally gives you enough time to kind of catch yourself, understand, go through, go through your five years or your four years as the case might be, easily with some help and with a, the least amount of stress in terms of your financial situation. And complete your program easily. So we, you can visit the website as well or contact any one of the four major banks. FCBs are good, they're very user-friendly. Republic Bank, they, they, they're very, very user-friendly in terms of the information that they provide you and how they work with you to get a help loan. Just some general information before I close. There are certain things that you need to know as well. There are, for example, if you have dropped out of the program and you want to re-enter the program, what happens is that we have to reassess you. So there would be certain types of 
would ask you for, such as an updated transcript, your know, a letter from the university, that kind of information, and you will also be subject to the means test. Uh, students, critical is that you will be funded only for the duration of your approved program and based on the means test. So please try to stay within the five year or the four year period. For me, I believe strongly in the fact that there are no traffic jams in the extra mile. So you just go the extra mile, try, work hard, stick to your five years and come out smiling. Again, check our FAQs on the website. You can contact us via 800 gate or send us an email at gate.info at moe.gov.tt. Thank you very much for having me and thanks for listening. Thank you, Ms. Loveless. I do have a few questions sure. here from students that I will present to you. You can read them accordingly and answer any that we may have. Okay. So, okay. so the first question was, what if you have a gate ID from a previous degree? A gate, your gate e-service ID is yours for your lifetime in the gate program. That ID, you don't need to change it. There isn't anything, um, there's no, there would be no change to that ID. You can use that same ID to log in and complete your application form. Okay, second question says, my gate application form from last year start, uh, says gate processing that I'm cleared and also to start a new application, unable to start a new application. Okay, so what that simply, gate processing is a status that is shown to the student when the institution, in this case, the university, has submitted a claim on your behalf. So that means that you are fine, you have already been given an approval and it, your application or your claim financial processing. It means that you are able now to start a new application, fill your form for the new academic period and submit it to us via the e-service. Um, the third question is, I sent my signed documents for financial clearance. I got a response of who not legible. I resent my information. Okay, so I am not sure in response to that question, I'm not sure if the student is referring to the university or if the student is referring to GATE. If you are referring to GATE, then what we ask is that you respond to the correction notification, that link that we would have sent you, send back the clearer images of the documents that we would have requested. I cannot tell you, sit here today and tell you that you're going to be cleared before Monday. The, the entire thing is a process. Even going through the application, it's a process. So what I can tell you is that once your application has been submitted, we will be looking at the applications as quickly as possible. Up to what, what age is GATE available to be approved? GATE is available for persons under the age of 50 only. Uh, what all documents need to be sent in in order for financial clearance. Okay, so again, I'm not sure whether the student is requesting information regarding financial clearance from the university or financial clearance from GATE. All of the documents that I have highlighted in my slides, those are the documents that we require for you to receive a GATE clearance. The sixth question, do you have to reapply for GATE every year? Actually, yes. And in the case of UE, you have to apply for GATE every single semester. In the case of FMS, you all, we do not um, accept applications for semester three because by the university standards, you all are two semesters. 
So you have to apply for every semester. Please, I ask you to monitor your gate applications and ensure that you apply every semester as long as you are enrolled and registered in the faculty and registered for courses. Very excellent question is the next one. In the means test, is the household income before or after taxes? It is before taxes. We will do our assessment once the student submits all of the information uh, regarding the household income, and we will determine what level or what percentage that the student will qualify for. Okay, the other question is, theoretically speaking, what if a household income is 12K, but there are a lot of kids in the family, mandatory expenses, mortgage, the means test. In a case like this, we ask that you contact us directly because we would not want to have your information, too much of, too many of your personal information made public. So in cases like this, when you would like us to have some kind of consideration based on what is going on in the household, we ask that you speak to the senior investigating officer personally, and she will determine how she's going to assess you at that point. While we have our policies, we are, we are not unkind, I have to say, for want of a better word, in, some, in terms of how we are assessing the students. But again, there is no guarantee that you're gonna get a perfect answer. It is just an opportunity for you to, pro to provide us with information so that we can reassess. How do you know if your, income, your in application is incomplete? You would know because we would send you a notification via email requesting additional information, both on the gate clearance side and on the means test side. So once you have provided us with information and we need additional information, we will send you an, an email. Do we have to repay our gate funding after? This is actually a very good question. Based on the policies of the gate program, there is a section in the student's contract that speaks to, I think it's the, the clause number nine that speaks to the students, what is called obligatory service. So what we are saying to you is that while we are not telling you come and pay us back the amount of money that we might have spent on your behalf, we are saying to you that once we have spent in excess of, uh, there are different ranges. So for example, under $50,000, we ask you to provide obligatory service to the country for one year, and then it goes all the way up. And once you cross 300,000, which is in the case of almost every program in FMS, your obligatory period of service is five years. However, if you wish to be relieved of your obligatory service, then there are certain steps that you have to follow. You have to visit the ministry, and then we will tell you what you will be required to do before we can issue such a letter to you, relieving you or deferring your obligatory service. Who can I contact for a locked account? Okay, uh, on the screen, you will see a list of contact, direct contact information. I would like you all to take note of the senior investigating officers in each department. So if you, if you take a look at the, the one that says verification and gate admin, and then there is IT, you are free to contact that second block, verification and admin, email them directly and someone will respond to you as soon as possible. Okay, my gate application states that clearance is approved. When will it be, when will I be made aware of how much gate I'm covering? How much gate is covering, right? Um, to give you, sit here and give you a timeline, I would be unfair to you. What I would tell you though, is that based on my interactions with the university, the bursary has not been affecting students negatively with regard to 
the amount of gait is covering. The means test element of the application form takes a little while longer than the other process, the other part of the process. And this is simply because sometimes a student might not submit all of the required documents. The student might, we might need to investigate something that the student has submitted to us. We might need to investigate the student. There are several different reasons why we would um, take a little longer than if I tell you two days, two weeks, 10 days. I will not be able to say how I, however, I can tell you that once you have submitted your information, it will be assessed. What is a fast track scenario? The fast track scenario is just a, a, a field that was included in the application, um, originally included in the application for the students who might have had a previous issue and needed to have the application process quickly. And that is all that it is. When transferring faculties, what is the process to acquire a new gate application? In terms of, and the other one is also, would the student be required to repay the fees of his or her previous program? This is an excellent question. Once you are transferring faculties, the gate policy says that if you are, have failed to complete a program originally paid for by gate, you, the student, will be required to refund all the money that we have paid. So when you are transferring faculties, I need you to be very, very conscious. Make sure that you get all of your information Contact the gate office before you do so. Always make sure that you have your documents. The bursary is also a very good point of reference for you in terms of transferring faculties. Okay, um, the last question for today is when will the gate site be working? Because presently I cannot start a new application. If I have received an email telling me that my application will be auto canceled, will that allow me to not be able to resubmit an application? I can, off the top of my head, I can tell you what has happened with this student. This student has started filling a form and did not go back to complete the form. And then that student might have had another application in the system. So it is literally confusing the system. That auto cancellation notice that you will that you would have received is the system reading that you never went back to the form. I would like you to look at the screen, take my contact information, and give me a call. Um, I don't know who the student is, but the student, I'm sure he or she is listening. Senior Stephanie Lovelace, give me a call or send me a direct email, and I would take. I would take a look at your profile and I would be able to guide you. Even if you're emailing me, if you don't get me and you have to email me, make sure that you put a mobile number so that I can reach you tomorrow morning. If you send it to me today, I will respond to you by tomorrow, please God. Okay. Final question. Can I access GATE for this semester at 49? Well, there are yeah, that, that two-part answer to that. The first question is, when will you be 50? If you're 49, when will you be 50? And the second part of it is, if you're 49 now and you access GATE, you will get GATE funding for only this semester. The moment you turn 50, your GATE funding will be cut. You will not be able to get funding for anything beyond the semester. And that is pretty much it. So thank you all so very much for your kind attention. I do appreciate your questions and I do hope that I have been helpful and I hope that the information that you all are taking with you will be useful in your life, in your career path here at the university and in your communication with us at GATE. Thank you again. Have a wonderful, wonderful semester. I wish you all the best and please stay safe thank you very much
Mrs. Loveless, for that very informative presentation. Students, we have tried to accommodate your questions as best as possible in a very short time frame. Um, anyone requesting further information, you can go to the, the websites that we advertise just now. We can put that information in the chat for you so that you can feel free to contact and email persons regarding all your queries. For our last segment, we do have our CMO, Dr. Roshan Parasram, delivering a talk on COVID. And this talk starts at 2 p.m. We all know that our CMO has a very busy schedule. He was able to facilitate us at 2 p.m. So we will be having an intermission and in that intermission, the live stream link will be up and running. However, you can pause, you can get something to eat, can get something to drink. And then when you come back for 2 p.m., you will be seeing your presentation with the CMO. We have one more day left for our orientation, which is Friday. I did notice that students were asking about the respective Zoom links. Please note that the school, School of Dentistry, School of Veterinary Medicine, School of Nursing, School of Pharmacy, Optometry Students, your school or department will be in contact with you to give you that access to that Zoom link. Additionally, I will be posting the Zoom links in the chat in the morning. So if you did not receive that email, do not stress. In the morning when you like sign into the live stream, you will be able. Once you click on that Zoom link, I would advise that you mute your mics so that you can hear your presentation based on ethics and professionalism by your respective speakers. So this brings us to our intermission point. I do thank you for your involvement, for your activeness in asking questions. I do not think I have any more questions. I see students are still asking information about GATE in the chat. So I will be sharing that contact information shortly. And I look forward to meeting with you at 2 p.m. again. Thank you and enjoy your break. Audio jungle. Audio jungle. Welcome to your first year experience at the UE St. Augustine campus. We at the Division of Student Services and Development are truly delighted that you have made the choice to hashtag BUE. And as your university family that cares, we have put together this short yet comprehensive orientation exercise to get you started for your new and exciting journey with us. As your orientation instructors, we are delighted to spend this time with you and guide you every step of the way through this very important learning exercise. During this online session, you will be introduced to valuable information that is specific and relevant to your first year of study. The information covers a range of important topics and is presented to you in eight short lessons that will allow you to learn all you need to know in a quick and simple manner. Here's how it will work. Each lesson will introduce you to a specific topic and will be presented to you via video. You are required to complete one lesson at a time before moving on to the next and pay very close attention to the information being shared with you in each lesson. Some lessons will provide quizzes, exercises, and activities for you to complete at the end. You are required to participate in this as it will help strengthen your understanding of the various topics that we will cover. We ask that you pay close attention to the information that will be shared with you in each lesson. Look out for the instructions, take notes, and open your mind to learning about your new university environment. Remember, your participation in the First Year Experience Program and this orientation exercise is important to your successful transition to the UWI St. Augustine campus. 
students, we are so excited to get you started and do hope that you get the most out of this fun, engaging and educational first year experience right here at the UE St. Augustine campus. Are you ready? Great, let's get started. Welcome to your first year experience at the UE St. Augustine campus. We at the Division of Student Services and Development are truly delighted that you have made the choice to hashtag BUE. And as your university family that cares, we have put together this short yet comprehensive orientation exercise to get you started for your new and exciting journey with us. As your orientation instructors, we are delighted to spend this time with you and guide you every step of the way through this very important learning exercise. During this online session, you will be introduced to valuable information that is specific and relevant to your first year of study. The information covers a range of important topics and is presented to you in eight short lessons that will allow you to learn all you need to know in a quick and simple manner. Here's how it will work. Each lesson will introduce you to a specific topic and will be presented to you via video. You are required to complete one lesson at a time before moving on to the next and pay very close attention to the information being shared with you in each lesson. Some lessons will provide quizzes, exercises and activities for you to complete at the end. You are required to participate in this as it will help strengthen your understanding of the various topics that we will cover. We ask that you pay close attention to the information that will be shared with you in each lesson. Look out for the instructions, take notes and open your mind to learning about your new university environment. Remember, your participation in the First Year Experience Programme and this orientation exercise is important to your successful transition to the UWI St. Augustine campus. Students, we are so excited to get you started and do hope that you get the most out of this fun, engaging and educational first year experience right here at the UE St. Augustine campus. Are you ready? Great, let's get started.
Hi. Brandon, you sound sick. Literally just started the video. How could you possibly know that? Literally everyone has been asking me, hello, you're blocking my face. Literally like seven people asked me to do it. So I'm gonna go ahead and fulfill all seven of those people's wishes and do part two. I may or may not be sick. May feels a little more accurate than may not, but last time I got um, almost nowhere. So this time I'm gonna try to get a little further than that. I like playing these games. Hopefully you guys enjoy these. If you don't, I'm gonna keep playing them. Day one of being sick, correct. Oh, something already. What is this? A door lock. Well, I'm trying to unlock doors. So you and I are trying to accomplish two different things. Excuse me as I pilfer through these drawers. <gasps> what a boat key. So we drop the boat key down by the boat. I know I'm sick. <laughs> Coffee while I wait. Oh, what have I done? <laughs> Grandma, you are the most nimble elderly woman. What is this? Oh, I'm finding all kinds of things. Gasoline can. Well, if anyone can do it, a gasoline. Okay, where does the gasoline can go? I didn't do that. Do we have a cat? I'm gonna go in here. <laughs> I can't make up my mind where I wanna go. Anywhere there aren't people who are trying to hit me with blunt objects. That's where I wanna go. What are these? Why can't I ever find like a baseball bat or something? A wrench? I forgot where the wrench goes. Oh, it goes in the creepy, my, my stepbrother's room. What did that do? Oh, so now I can go visit my little brother. Don't want to. Have you seen him? You got that from grandma. You ugly as dirt. Oh, what is this? Glass fuse. I don't know how to piece together a vehicle. That's literally all I'm finding are vehicle parts. <gasps> They're all, oh, Jesus! Grandpa, do you know how to fix a fuse box? And, oh, what is this? Oh, that wasn't me. This is new. I don't know where I am. <laughs> so the door is locked. I'm good. I'm just going
Yes. Okay, students, good afternoon and welcome back to this afternoon session where we are going to discuss facing up to the challenge of COVID-19, which is being facilitated by Dr. Roshan Parasram. Dr. Parasram, as we all know, is our Chief Medical Officer at the Ministry of Health. He is a physician and public health consultant working as a Chief Medical Officer of Trinidad and Tobago. In his capacity as Chief Medical Officer, he is the national focal point as it relates to international health regulations. He tenures as the Quarantine Authority for Trinidad and Tobago. Accordingly, he is also the Chairman of the Multi-Sectoral Committee to Treat with COVID-19, the novel coronavirus, and any emerging infectious diseases. He is the Chairman of various national committees, including the Drug Advisory Committee, Food Advisory Committee, Pesticides and Toxic Chemicals Control Board, National Drug Advisory Committee, Arboviral Committee, Clinical Assessment Committee, Psychiatric Tribunals, Antibiotics Committee, Optician Boards, and the member of the Medical Board of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Parasram, I now hand over to you. Welcome and thank you for facilitating us this afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you and welcome to everyone, all the students. Um, to the lecture, I will try my best to paint the picture of where we are at in terms of COVID-19 and of course, what has been the major challenges affecting our system. So the audio is fine, I take it. Yes, we are hearing you quite well. Okay, um, so just in terms of, I'm just trying to get my presentation up. Give me a second. Okay. You wanna, are you seeing any anything as yet? No, not as yet. Right, one second. It should be coming up in a few seconds, I hope. Yes, we are seeing it loading. Okay, Dr. Parash, yeah. it's up and ready to go. It is? Yeah. Right. Yes, it's showing. So you see it, all right. Uh, let me just begin the slides. Okay, so if everyone is seeing, we can start. So facing up to the challenges of COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago, our response, understanding the challenges and implementing practical solutions. So the presentation will focus basically a history of the pandemic from its outset, including where we are in Trinidad and Tobago, the local context, some of our challenges and some of our solutions thus far. So as you would be aware, on December 21st, 2019, the Wuhan Municipal Health Commission in China reported a cluster of cases of a pneumonia in Wuhan, Hubei province. It was a novel coronavirus was eventually identified, but originally presented as severe acute respiratory illness of unknown origin. Um, that was subsequently traced to a wet market in that particular province. And as we all know it today, it, is, it has been linked to something called COVID-19 in the early days of the epidemic. It would have been called coronavirus. Um, March 11, 2020, the WHO declares the coronavirus a pandemic. And a pandemic meaning, generally speaking, that it affects the entire globe. And WHO has a specific way to define how it is affecting the world. It is divided, the world that is into many sub-regions we are a part of the Americas, which is the Caribbean region is a subset of the Americas. There are other regions, example, Africa, Asia, and different parts of the world that are categorized as WHO. So for something to be a pandemic, then there must be ongoing transmission of an epidemic 
existing in at least three different WHO categories at the same time. So at the time it was declared they were actually occurring epidemics in more than three. So WHO declared on March 11, the WHO pandemic coronavirus. As you know, coronavirus is a group of viruses, a sub subgroup of which is COVID-19. So it is a novel type of coronavirus. Coronavirus is a, is a virus that actually is very common. We had coronavirus type illnesses in Trinidad long before COVID-19. It normally is a flu-like, causes a flu-like mild illness, and it is part of the common cold spectrum. So this pandemic in terms of growth has grown exponentially. Uh, in the past week or so, it has been categorized as having 27.6 million cases worldwide and very close to 900,000 deaths in a period from December till present. And deaths across nearly every country in the world has already occurred. As you know, Trinidad is roughly about 40 deaths thus far since the beginning of our epidemic. The global situation has evolved dramatically since the onset of the pandemic in Brazil and US, accounting for over 75% of the world cases. In the recent last few months, the epicenter has shifted away from China and other parts of Europe and has become the US, where we are seeing the highest rates of growth per day, and Brazil as well, which is part of the Americas of which Trinidad and Tobago is a part. Um, so the numbers in Brazil and US usually are around 55 to 50,000 cases per day of new infections. That's over a 24 period. The transmission of the disease had the ability to overwhelm the health systems. Governments were urged to prepare their health systems for an attack to take urgent and aggressive action to change the course of the pandemic. So this is in terms of our Trinidad and Tobago picture thus far. This is from March 12th when we had our first case. Our first case, if you all recall, would have been a national who returned to Trinidad and Tobago and presented with a flu-like illness. We had been testing for COVID-19 through the Caribbean Public Health Agency for roughly a month, five weeks prior to that, going back to the 7th, I believe, of February. So we were testing for COVID-19 in addition to other respiratory illnesses, for example, H1N1 and other 14 other pathogens, which we normally detect for before COVID-19 came along. So this, if you look at this graph, it actually shows laboratory confirmed cases in Trinidad and Tobago during both phase one. Phase one started, as I said, March 12th and went all the way up to July 20th. July 20th to present is what we are calling phase two, um, meaning there was an inter, a clear intermingling period somewhere between the end of April to, the, to July 20th, when we actually had an 80 day period without any new infections in the country, aside from one or, two, one or two sporadic cases, which were in the repatriated individuals, as you know, our borders remain closed, our official borders. In terms of the cases you see spread throughout the country, there's a high density within the East-West corridor on the North, goes down into the South, um, where we have San Fernando in the Victoria area, we have a cluster of a large clustering of cases there as well. We see in the southeast part of the country, as well as the northeast, there's a, a, a very small amount of cases. So they're free of disease to the most part. In the Cedrus area as well, we see only a couple of cases in that particular area. So this is a GIS map. Geographic information system is utilized to actually plot cases of any disease using a geographic pattern. And what we can do is layer various things upon it. So we can layer, for instance, the relationship of hospitals. We can put different layers on it to see where cases may be caused by a certain epidemiological link fa linking factor. For example, they, in, in other types of diseases where we saw cases clustering around something called, uh, a, for instance, a plant, a factory that would have created some sort of link, epidemiological link. GIS will tell you basically the relationship between those cases and a particular environmental hazard. So in this case, we will see in cases throughout most of the country at this point. Again, this is this one actually shows phase two without the phase one. Similar pattern, as you know, most of our cases will have come between at phase two. We had 138 cases in phase one, the majority of which would have been linked to some sort of travel coming back into the country. The last couple of cases weren't linked in that way. Again, um, laboratory confirmed cases, phase two, June to September. This one, we take away 
the cases that would have been attributed to repatriation, meaning persons coming back. So these are the purely local cases. So we have discussed the origin of phase two. Phase two started with the with persons coming through the, the, the border, possibly legally, through not the official border, and of course, bringing with them this virus and then spreading it to our population. So we saw phase two beginning clearly when we did our epidemiological linking of the first few cases and a number of them afterwards. They showed a direct link to persons coming across our, our border and infecting our locals within. A lot of them would have been attributed to persons actually coming bringing, assisting those persons to come into our border. So we look at our age sex distribution for COVID-19 thus far, we see a slight male preponderance overall, 54% males affected, 46% female, the majority of affected individuals 25 to 49 years of age, more women than men in the 50 to 54 age group and the 55 to 59 age group, and 9.84% comprise persons less than 19 years. And of course, those were broken into 5.3% being male and 4.47% being female. We have seen a death rate up to recent times in Trinidad and Tobago of about 1.51% before today, that would have been for yesterday, meaning the, and that is taking the total number of lab confirmed cases and dividing that by the total number of deaths, the opposite way around. So that is our death rate. Globally, we have seen a debt rate anywhere between 2 and 5%. It varies based on the demographic of persons affected as well. The, how quickly the disease spreads its ability for the countries to cope in terms of their health system. What we have been able to do in Trinidad, thankfully up to this point, is slow the, the rises of cases to a point where our, our ICU, HDU capacity has not been outstretched as yet. If there's a fast increase in number of critically ill people, it can do that very easily. So that is what we are guarding against at this point. And of course, trying to control the number of deaths that we have. We have seen the majority of deaths occurring in the elderly, persons with comorbid illnesses. And that is a mirror of what is happening internationally. Persons greater than 60 years of age with diabetes, hypertension, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and other immunocompromised states. We have had a few deaths below 60 years of age, and those, to the most part, have been individuals that also have comorbidities. Um, so it has mirrored to more or less the international demographic of deaths, and we are really trying our best to protect our vulnerable populations, which are basically those that I just described. So in terms of our cases by date collected, so you would have noted, for instance, in one particular day, there would have been reporting of over 150 cases. Our, this has been disaggregated by the date that the swab was actually taken. So it gives you a better idea of when the illnesses would have come. So if you look at the graphs, the blue graphs represent July, the purple ones represent August, and the dark blue on the right-hand side represent September. So looking at our graph, it would seem that on Epi Week 24, 25, which coincides to the middle, to the end of August, we would have had a lot, the largest peak. And that would have coincided with some events that took place. As you all know, there was an election in this country on the 10th of August. Prior to that, there was a two week period where persons gathered in large mass without wearing their masks, without having any social distance. And what we think is that that would have created those spikes that we saw in the middle of August and the end of August, um, respectively, creating large spikes where we see upwards of 110 being our maximum at we happy week 25 um, in terms of the days going forward that we have the largest number of cases. Thankfully, we have seen a decline since then. Into the, we, our, our lag in terms of specimen testing is about a week. So I would say up to the end of August, we are fairly confident that those figures are correct, meaning that we had actually seen a substantial drop in the cases um, that are labeled 37, 38, 39, 40 so far um, from the large rise that we saw coming towards the end of August. So we are hopeful that with the measures that we put in place on about the 17th of August, which is, as you would recall, there's a large number of uh, decrease in activities, closure of the beaches, closures of the rivers, and those, all those activities that we close are really to decrease the amount of mass gathering that is occurring in the country. 
persons can't congregate less than five and all the other measures are really to decrease the likelihood of this virus jumping from one individual to another. And these are measures that have been used across the world um, with varying successes based on the adherence to the public health recommendations. So in terms of our local context, January 22, the Ministry of Health monitoring COVID-19. March 11th, coronavirus declared a pandemic. March 12th, first case recorded. March to June, the first wave, which I described before. July to present, the second wave. August 26th, new stay-at-home quarantine orders. And cases so far, 2,588. The number of deaths, this was a few days ago, 39. It is now standing at 40. Discharge so far, 749. That will increase as well as we started to discharge persons from the community. So our first wave again, March 11th to June. So these are some characteristics. It was well within our testing capacity because the numbers were very low in terms of the number of cases. So of course, if you have smaller number of cases, the majority of them being persons that would have repatriated and been in controlled environments, that, that spread to primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary contracts would not have occurred. And therefore our follow-up would have been minimal in terms of swabbing. We would have seen actual decline in the number of people presenting to our hospital facilities greatly over the period April to June, which would have um, basically created a, a lull in the number of samples. Let's present it to you. Yeah. Number of samples that we took based on the number of people that were actually ill and presenting to our facilities. Historically, in terms of our number of viral illnesses presenting to our health centers and hospitals, we saw a significant decrease in the number of persons presenting. There were very few people presenting to any, any one of those um, places between April and June of this year. And therefore sampling could not have occurred because persons were presenting with viral illness. The numbers were very low because of all the measures we had put in place early on in the year. The number of deaths, again, in that first phase, active cases were 116. Um, eight in the first phase, number of samples have been tested were 1384 at the time. So our de-escalation pathway went as follows. And this would have been um, when we tried to reopen the economy. When we saw the numbers remaining low, there was no additional numbers occurring over April, May, June. We decided to reopen and what we re reopened early in, in phase one was food establishments and restaurants, itinerant and non-itinerant businesses allowed to commence curbside pickup and takeout deliveries and drive throughs We started and those were the lowest risk categories at the time. We went on to phase two, which was reopening of the manufacturing sector, food and beverage, pharmaceuticals and all construction. In terms of auto garages, tire shops, laundromats and dry cleaners, those were phase two reopening as well. In terms of phase three, we went back up a little bit, 25% in the public service in terms of their capacity, reopening of retail stores, including car dealerships, dental, optometric, ophthalmic, physical therapy and occupational therapy and services, together with professional services, which include surveyors and architects. In phase five, we went up again. As, as you note, we increased the capacity of human movement, taking a little bit more risk each time to see if there was an increase in the viral illness um, again, hairdressers and spas, which are close contact and have great risk of spread, but they had measures in place, as you know, um, to avoid spread wearing masks during their sessions and staying as distant as possible before your actual session. Domestic workers, including housekeepers, maids, etc., were let, let to come back out to work. And in phase five, we saw reopening of places of worship where we had congregation, reopening of cinemas and bars and gyms as well as reopening of malls, as well as re return to the full capacity for the public service. Phase five was planned for September, which we never got to phase five um, in terms of reopening of the schools. As you know, schools have now been pushed at least until January 1st. And we have seen in other countries where they tried to reopen schools, they had to close the, close the schools within a week or two. For example, in the United States, they would have seen over 90,000 cases occurring in two, in two weeks of opening of their schools. So schools with children being gregarious in nature, not, not having social distancing and commingling quite a lot and having asymptomatic spread allows for quick spread of any, any infectious disease across a country. 
So first race characteristics, again, schools, schools were closed, borders were closed, use of moral suasion in terms of mask wearing, stay at home orders for the entire country, MOH released guidelines for each sector. So we did guidelines for, um, for reopening of various sectors, including restaurants and beyond bars. We did um, cinemas and theaters. We did gyms and a number of other public sector guidelines, which told people how to basically go into the new normal, which is increased social distancing, use of face masks, increased hygiene, and no mask, no entry. There was a phased approach to the reopening. There was no community spread. At that time, we actually had no spread in Trinidad as listed in WHO. And there was a focus and continues to be a focus on saving lives. During our second wave, which started on 20th of July, we had increased testing based on the increased numbers that presented with viral-like symptoms. New, new testing sites were created as quickly as they could be done, um, as the numbers quickly outstripped our capacity in, in being able to test, which is not unique to Trinidad. It have happened all over the world. Introduction of the quarantining at home. Patients have been home quarantined under the respective offices of the CMOH and the building out of our hospital capacity, as well as eight step-down facilities, giving us quite a large number of um, hospital beds and quarantine facilities that we could use to put persons to avoid spread in the community. Um, during the second wave, as we had been seven months already into the fight with COVID, what we saw is we wanted to avoid burnout of essential workers, expansion of our workforce, leveraging of technology, and strategies to balance the economy and the need for health security evolving public health policy and consistent reinforcement of public health messaging. The number of samples thus far now stand at 33,530 taken and the number of samples tested positive 2,493, active cases 1,705, deaths 39, discharges 749. So second wave characteristics, there was significant non adherence to the new normal. So a lot of times people say that when you when you actually Mr. Avatar Singh. So a lot of times when you when you do very well and when there's no cases for a long period of time, there came a time in May or June where people did not see the utility of wearing masks, of, of abiding by the any of the public health recommendations that were made. So the new normal, in my view, was not adopted because there were a lack of cases and there were people saw themselves at very low risk at that point in time. Schools were planned to reopen. They were reopened for persons for one month prior to the SEA exam. Um, and school aid children were infected quickly thereafter when the, the wave began on July 20th. We saw with the primary case that we had, that person had a, a child in one of the schools and that person went on to infect three or four individuals at that particular school. Um, again, the, the, the focus remains on saving lives and schools to be reopened and has reopened now in September using a hybrid model where you have online learning taking place in a lot of schools. So our challenges is sustaining a parallel system, meaning for, for instance, there cannot be a parallel system for every part of our treatment. For, for example, there cannot be a neurosurgical parallel system simply because our system neurosurgeons are very low number in our system, and it's very difficult to create a parallel system for every particular specialty, every discipline. We just don't have the manpower and we don't have the, the systems in place in any country to create everything as a parallel system. There's a, there was a, a great rise in the early part of August to the late part of August of cases, testing capacity constraints, simply because our testing, our numbers outstrip strip the capacity to do daily tests. There was a redistribution of the human resource capacity to go to targeted areas coming out of his, um, certain services, for example, surgeries that were not that were elective were canceled for short periods of time. Information services in terms of tracking patients and resources were, uh, were and continue, continue to be a challenge in terms of the use of the app and other technologies. Not here, non adherence to the public health guidelines continue to be a a significant contributor to the increased number of cases. Mandatory mass. So there was a move away from moral suasion to legislation. As you know, legislation was passed. So now, now in public spaces, 
person have to wear masks, otherwise there's a ticketing system in place. There's self-management and conditions for quarantine of those facilities. Solutions, of course, were expansion of testing facilities. As of today, we, we can now do 12, roughly 1,287 tests per day in Trinidad and Tobago. Given a few weeks ago, we would have only been able to do about six or 700. So we are almost doubling in terms of our capacity today. Um, increased capacity of healthcare workers throughout the system. We have brought in persons who would have been unemployed, some house officers, as well as nurses, as well as we have looked beyond our borders to Cuba and other countries to bring persons in to assist the national effort. Revised treatment and care protocols, leaning heavily on the WHO standards, the use of technology to enhance healthcare service delivery. For example, we would have used some telemedicine services to, to reach out to persons to check on their health rather than them coming in to the system. There would have been repeat prescriptions being sent out to individuals so they don't have to come in as well. Local manufacturing of PPE, for instance, we have manufactured the cloth face masks locally. There have been manufacture of surgical gowns which can be reused. So we don't have to depend on international supply chains which have gone down around the world, especially for non-pharmaceutical items. Continued intersectoral collaboration, and of course, change in the public health regulation where you saw a reversal of some of the opening back measures that occurred, beaches, in-house dining, reduction in social gatherings, closure of cinemas and theaters, closure of bars, those sort of um, in-house dining at bars. Focus on lives and livelihood. This pandemic will be with us for quite some time until, any, until either one of two things happen, until countries get herd immunity, uh, in which case there's no way that the virus can propagate itself going from one individual to the next. If you get a vaccine that is very effective and safe and can be given to the majority of your population, then of course, because of the vaccine, people having the antibodies to that disease, they can't spread it as well, they can't contract it. So um, depending on herd immunity from other countries is another way that the virus can die itself out. For instance, if most of Europe and USA gets herd immunity, the virus may essentially not be able to come into other territories from those areas. Again, strengthening border control measures and other public health measures. As you know, our borders remain closed, our legal borders. Enforcement of the new normal is the way forward and the only way we can go forward and return to any life of normalcy in Trinidad, meaning that we all have to abide to the wearing of masks, social distancing, even amongst our friends and colleagues, we have to ensure that we wear our masks if we cannot maintain social distancing, because this is an invisible disease. It can go from one person to the next, and we do not know who is an asymptomatic carrier. We do not know who is in a transmissible phase. So we have to protect ourselves from everyone. Strengthened health promotion campaigns to strengthen the public health understanding of the new normal. Of course, legislative frameworks were required, for example, the wearing of masks, with a collaboration with the national security to ensure adherence to quarantine orders and heighten social responsibility. Okay, thank you. And I'll take any questions that you all may have. Okay, Dr. Paris Ram, it seems like our students don't have any questions at this point in time. They do send their regards and I wish to thank you for that presentation. It was very informative this afternoon. The faculty is very appreciative and I'm sure that our students who were logged in were also very appreciative. Yep. Thanks for the time and, and, and please do take care as, as we are in the midst of COVID-19. Thank you. So students, this concludes our orientation session for today. Tomorrow we have our session where we talk about ethics and professionalism. Zoom links would have been sent, as we mentioned, to students once again. If you have not received a Zoom link, I am going to put this in the chat, in the chat link, where you can send me an email citing your name and your program. Please specify if you are a student of nursing, optometry, dentistry. So that way you would get the correct Zoom link and there would be no mix-ups. I thank you all again for your participation in orientation sessions today. And I look forward to meeting with everyone tomorrow.
my email address I am sending now for those who have not received the Zoom link. Thank you once again, and that concludes today's orientation session.